going to do one more. Sound check presenter. Sound check presenter. Sound check clerks. Sound check clerks. Sorry, folks, I'm going to do that one more time.
Sound check presenter. Sound check presenter. Sound check clerks. Sound check clerks.
Mayor, we are we are live. Okay, good, thank you, and good morning, everyone. After a glorious weekend, and hopefully a glorious week in terms of the weather, and uh, we have vaccinations going on at our first Ontario Centre. Great video, by the way, uh, Jason Farr. Thank you for that. I'll, uh, I'll have to get some pointers on how you pulled that one together. It was very sharp. And uh, I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order. Board of Health meeting for today. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website. All electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during our council meetings. And members are reminded of the five minute time limit which will be adhered to during this meeting. Members can submit another request to speak if they require more time to ask questions or make comments. I'm now going to turn to a roll call to see if you are all in attendance. So I'm gonna start with Councillor Wilson. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Farr. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, thank you for morning. comments. Thank you. Councillor Nan. Councillor Marula. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Good how morning. are you today? Just peachy, thanks. Councillor Collins. Good morning, present. Good morning, Councillor Jackson. <coughs> Not yet with us, Councillor Paul. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning. Good to see you. Hope you're feeling better. Councillor Danko. Present. Councillor Clark. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. Councillor Pearson. Present. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. Councillor Johnson. Good morning. Just a heads up, sir, that I'm having broadband issues. So if I'm not on screen, I'm listening. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Uh, good morning, Fred. Good morning. Councillor Vanderbeek. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Whitehead. And Councillor Partridge. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. And good I morning. will need to jump off for another meeting at 1030, but it shouldn't be more than about 20 minutes and I'll be back on. And I'm on eScribe again, so thank you. Okay, good news, that's great. And we'll uh, we'll uh, keep an eye on your, your uh, your e-scribe while we're working here, hopefully it all works. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, Mr. Uh, Mayor, we have several um, additional delegation requests from Dr. Natasha Johnson of McMaster University, from Cassia Johnson, McMaster University, Timothy O'Shea of McMaster University, Claire Bodkin, McMaster University, Dr. Mark Walton, of McMaster University and Ruth Rodney of York University respecting the structural reform of the Board of Health. And we also have uh, those are requests to, to delegate and then we have additional um, delegations that were approved at a, at a previous meeting from Lyndon George and Dr. Natasha, oh, no, uh, Lyndon George and Madeline Verhosek re regarding the same subject matter, the structural reform of the Board of Health. Okay, thank you. So all those delegations are for today? Yes, they are, sir. Okay. Thank you then. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Moved by Councillor Johnson, second by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Electronic vote as there is no comments. This is going to come up, it is up. Assume that's carried, Councillor. Or Councillor Lauren. Danko, are you able to vote? Okay. Thumbs up. Thank you. And that's carried 13 0. Thank you. And any, any declarations of interest on this agenda today? Good morning, Councillor Nan. Uh, seeing none. Uh, the, so we're going to turn to a motion to approve the minutes of February the 19th uh, as it's presented. Anyone have any issues with the minutes? If not, motion by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Farr. All in favor of the minutes? Thank you. Vote is up. And Lauren, I assume again, that's it's carried. 
Yes, that is, again, that carries 13-0. Thank you. Uh, there are then the added delegation of requests, items 6-1 uh, through 266. Is there a motion to approve the delegation requests for today? Motion moved by Nan, seconded by Pauls. Okay, thank you. Again, a motion, electronic motion required. And that carries 14-0. Thank you, Lauren. So we will now move to our uh, delegations. We will hear from our delegates attending today's virtual meeting. Then we will view the uh, video submissions from the rest of the delegates. So the, our first virtual delegation is Lyndon George. And just a reminder for all delegates that uh, it is five minutes and then potentially some questions from uh, members of the board. And so I'm going to turn it over to Lyndon George. I see you there, Lyndon. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Mayor, uh, Councillors. It's a pleasure to be with you here this morning. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I reside in Ward 2. Uh, my city councillor is Jason Farr. Uh, Jason, it's great to see you. And uh, the reason I'm here today is to uh, start the conversation, and it's an important one regarding the structural changes to our Board of Health. You know, when I, when I look around uh, my, I would say the room here today, uh, it is, I see 13 city councillors who are doing incredible work in our community uh, to, and they're on the Board of Health. And what we see in other communities in Toronto and in Ottawa, there are community voices that are also in the room who are helping to shape the discussion of healthcare. And that's an important part of what, what I would say is an important part of healthcare in our community. And so we're joining you here today to be able to start that conversation about what structural reforms to our Board of Health would look like. And it's not just us saying this. The Chief Medical Officer uh, came out with a report in October 2020 talking about the impacts of COVID and a call for urgency for structural changes to boards of health and to community health care. And so we want to echo that call here today. The individuals who are going to be speaking with you are healthcare leaders. And they're here not to represent any particular faculty or university or, or specific issue. They're here to share their experience and to help echo that call. And it was important for them to be here today because they know the urgency of the moment. And so I, I'm, I'm honored to be just opening up this dialogue on their behalf. But I also recognize that we that this question is, is a question that we're asking to say, how do we best serve our community when it comes to health care? How do we how do we ensure that Hamilton's voices, equitable voices are at the table from diverse communities, from our indigenous community, from racialized communities and and, and so much more. And so I'm, I'm asking you all here today to understand that over the coming weeks, we're going to hopefully be meeting with you to talk to you about the urgency of this, to share our hopes, but to also listen to what your concerns are about what that structural reform would mean at the board. It means that, you know, similar to Toronto, where you have individuals with lived experience, educational background, um, and expertise in healthcare being a part of this discourse. We see in Toronto how the Board of Health there is leading the fight on COVID on important issues uh, when we talk about vaccination and when we talk about uh, the critical impact in the way it dis uh, COVID disproportionately impacts particular communities. And so that's really where I want to go with this here today. I hope that when we start this dialogue with you, you'll be open and transparent with us, just as we will be with you. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I want to take the opportunity again to say thank you for, uh, for allowing us this opportunity to be with you. And if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer, uh, answer them here today. Thank you very much, Lyndon, for your, your presentation. And I'll uh, turn to the board. I think there's a speaker's list activated. We have uh, uh, first up, Councillor Farr. Go ahead, Councillor. Lyndon, good to see you too. And I appreciate the introduction to several other delegates that are coming. I'm intrigued by this, as you probably are aware, and those delegates, in many cases, um, this Board of Health is reported to uh, by either our Medical Officer of Health, Associate Medical Officers of Health, Michelle Barrett, and others who work in sometimes official, sometimes unofficial uh, subcommittees with the various groups that you've described here today that you're, you're seeing as 
um, an integral, a future integral part of our board makeup, this board makeup. Um, but we do um, uh, consult, and there's no um, no getting around how uh, good a job actually that we do. Whether it's um, you know even uh, investing both uh, in resources and uh, a, a pretty considerable amount of finances in partnering with McMaster University right across the road from. Um, from, from City Hall. So there's that collaborative effort that most people recognize. My question through you, Mr. Mayor, what makes this system better than a reporting body from various subcommittees? Linda? Yeah, it's a good question, Councillor. Uh, I, I would say that for, for, for many of us in the community that have been trying to have uh, constructive conversations in healthcare, uh, we we often are left feeling as if we are on the outside, uh, that those issues are having to go through uh, multiple steps uh, to finally get to the point where we're having the honest conversation, um, and 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 that and it can be quite frustrating at times. And so when we started to look at other boards and saying, you know, why is why is their structure different? Uh, it wasn't necessarily because of the specific issues that we were experiencing, but it was us saying, wait a minute, during SARS, there was the Campbell report that called for these structural changes to boards of health, um, you know, close to a decade ago. Um, and, and in Hamilton, unfortunately, we haven't made those structural changes. And so when we see again, um, the chief medical officer again, making these kind of calls to address structural changes, we are saying, you know, while while it may seem as if it's working at, at this time, in fact, what we're finding is that it's often we are having to have multiple conversations uh, just to get to the point of saying, are you hearing us? And that is where we're hoping here that we can allow uh, and rather provide an opportunity at the table in real time to have these conversations in the room with you. Got it. Direct access. And you said there in your close through you, Mr. Mayor, that in the coming weeks, um, uh, various uh, folks attached to this idea will be reaching out to in individual councillors. I'm sure we'll also hear uh, from the delegates today of why this is a sound um, uh, suggestion. Um, so, so we'll we'll have that opportunity then. Am I, am I hearing you clearly that uh, we'll have opportunities in the uh, near future to to have our our own meetings individually as councillors to get a better understanding of what's being proposed here? Thank you. That's correct, councillor. And we'll also be uh, putting forward uh, our letter and our motion uh, in the uh, for the April meeting, where we'll be able to hopefully talk with like during between now and April to start to talk about what those structural changes look like and what our hopes are. And so in our in our in our letter, which we'll we'll be sending to councillors and, and talking to you about and fleshing out some of the structural changes and, and what we're hoping for, um, that that that's where we're hoping to to have that dialogue and on those one on ones and 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 really hear you know how how can we can how can we improve it without reinventing the same reports that have said before uh, we need those changes now. Okay, thanks, Mr. Mayor. This is uh, definitely a board, not a standing committee, though for all of my time on council and for many generations, I guess it it's felt uh, and looked and smelt like a standing committee, but uh, certainly we have it within our purview to uh, to make some changes, and uh, I, I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lyndon. Good to see you again. You too, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Wilson? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Good morning, Mr. George. Welcome to the Board of Health. I appreciate you being here. Um, just for folks who are who are watching, uh, you referenced uh, an October 2020 uh, statement, I believe, by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. I just want clarity uh, for those that that's Canada's Chief Medical Officer of Health. Is it through you, Mr. Yes. Mayor? Okay. Uh, good morning, Councillor Wilson. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And that um, announcement by Dr. Tam was prompted um, by uh, the COVID, um, by, by the conditions of, of this public health crisis, was it? Do you know? That's correct, Councillor, yes. Mm -hmm. And in her remarks, um, I think the Chief Medical Officer of Health, you're saying, also referenced the outcome of SARS. Is that correct? It is in the report as well, and, and also in the Campbell report, um, which came out following SARS. Right. Uh, some of those recommendations around structural changes uh, to boards of health. Yes, thank you. I'll have some questions for staff about um, Mr. Campbell's uh, report 
and his directives and why um, following the delegations, or it may come out uh, in greater detail in the delegations. But um, so I, it, I'm not sure what the delegates are going to say, but I was wondering if, if you were able to, to summarize uh, what was the outcome of SARS and what is the outcome of COVID in terms of um, health uh, inequities of outcome through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the, the points that I would like to, to also add is that some of those individuals who will be delegating today, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Bohosik is unable to, to be here with us to, to answer some of those specific questions, but will be providing a video uh, as well. And what you'll be getting is a sense of the, the, the lived realities of health leaders and the urgency of now, but speaking to many of uh, what, what has been published already, and, and I say that with regards to uh, the, the equity report, uh, risk, it's called Risk to Resilience, and it, it really does lay out the, the, the blueprint and, and, and say, here's why we need to act, here's the critical issues. And when you and when you look at that report and you look at the, the Campbell report, um, they're very similar in, in my opinion. Again, I'm 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 saying this from from someone who's who's looked at them and said, why are we in the same space asking for very similar things um, when when we see time and time again? And oftentimes uh, it is racialized communities, indigenous communities calling for transformational change to address these issues. And, and the feel is that, you know, we're coming back and asking for similar things in order to improve health care um, so we can have it a little bit more equitable. But, you know, uh, to, to answer your question, I, I would say that these reports speak to uh, a call for urgency uh, and, and to lay out in a very, very clear way how, how to move forward. Thank you, Mr. George. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Councillor Nan. Thank you, through you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Lyndon, for being here this morning. Just checking that my mic is, yes, great. Um, yes, uh, if, primarily I wanna thank you for the approach that you've laid out for introducing the topic, uh, the thoughtfulness inside of it, but most importantly, the important conversation that you are bringing to the table for us as a board to consider in terms of structural changes, which I believe I heard you say clearly is fundamentally about um, addressing the population outcomes and the opportunity for us as a board to lead. Um, the question I had kind of dovetails off of um, the question that Councillor Farr asked regarding uh, the structural difference of having a subcommittee report to the Board of Health versus a structural change of the Board of Health. I also appreciate that there's other delegates who might be able to answer the question, but could you just speak to the necessity or the value of removing those kind of layers that speak to uh, you know, I think what has been a historical attempt to structurally change or uh, structurally include more voices into a board or a governing table of some sort. That conversation is often left to the side for a side, side table discussion and then integrated into a larger one. Why do you feel like that kind of structure would, wouldn't address what you're aiming to achieve here in terms of population outcomes related to health? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Councillor Nan, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, there, you know, it, through my own healthcare journey, um, I, I've, I've had the opportunity to become a patient advisor uh, for for different health communities here in, here here in the city. And one of the things that I often find is I'm I'm sitting on equity and diversity task force. I'm I'm sitting on advisory panels, and oftentimes there's a filter. There's a filter where you provide that information. Uh, it then uh, gets taken and, and you know, set at, at, a, at another level. And oftentimes that voice doesn't feel like that the discussion that you're having in that subcommittee room, in those task force rooms, are genuinely being reflected in an authentic way in the actual uh, decision makers rooms. And so, you know, when we talk about inclusion, it's about, it's about having that seat at the table and having your voice being heard. And oftentimes uh, in healthcare, time matters. And the ability to deal with these issues uh, as they are happening are critical. And we see that in Toronto at their Board of Health and their ability to, to, to raise those issues from particular communities that are disproportionately impacted and how they've, 
uh, had that discussion and talked about testing and talked about um, uh, vaccine rollouts in ways in which have frankly been very, very, um, uh, I can say that from, from, from a personal point of view, reassuring that we can hear at, that it is happening in those rooms. Um, you know, we talk about the vaccine rollout sometimes and around uh, particular communities having vaccine hes hesitancy. It is, a, it is much easier to be able to say when you see yourself reflected in decision-making bodies that you feel a sense of trust and belonging um, around that discussion. And that's the point, and, and, and that's really what our motion and our letter will be speaking to, uh, uh, you know, as we, as we move forward. Councilor Nan? Thank, thank you, much appreciated, that's all. Okay, thank you. Councilor Jackson? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. My apologies for being a few minutes late. I was on the phone Good with morning. a constituent. And uh, Mr. George, nice to uh, meet you virtually. I hope someday we could finally meet each other face to face like traditional days. Um, Mr. George, I'm listening very closely and carefully. And you're speaking of equity um, at the Board of Health table. So I'm trying to understand, and you wanna just start a conversation and I'm open-minded, but you're not actually looking that non-elected members of our community would have equal say and decision-making and voting ability at the elected body of the Board of Health that the 16 of us sit on. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Linda. Uh, good morning, Councillor Jackson, pleasure to meet you. And uh, I, I, would, I would frame it as we are looking to ensure that community voices are being heard at the table, and in Toronto, um, these this you know it may sound like a radical idea, um, council. When we talk about it here, when we have 13 city councillors, but if you were to say the same thing in, in in other communities like Ottawa and in Toronto, it, it 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 is something that has worked, where they have been able to bring in health experts, lived experience, and be able to help shape public discourse. And so, uh, the motion that we will be talking about is about that transformation of including voices at the board of health. Uh, and, and asking for their space to be created to allow those voices to be in the room and at the table. Okay, I, I appreciate your the honesty and sincerity of your response. And um, obviously we're not, I, su I suspect Mr. Mayor, we may not be getting into the fulsome of discussion today. Uh, we have lots of other delegates to hear from as well. Um, obviously I'd like to hear from Dr. Richardson as well to see what medical officers of health have done in Toronto and Ottawa where board of health have been restructured so that non-elected members of the community respectfully bringing tremendous talents to a table potentially, but want to have the equal decision-making opportunity that 16 elected members of our community given to us by 550,000 taxpayers and residents have given us to oversee. Board of Health and the overall corporation of the city. So, Mr. George, I appreciate you starting the conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Lyndon, for your presentation. I see no further questions for you. We have a number of other uh, presenters, so we'll move on to that as well. So our next uh, presenter is Dr. Natasha Johnson, McMaster University. And Dr. I see a couple of added faces here, so I'm not sure which is which. I'm, oh, there you are. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to get started. Uh, my name is Dr. Natasha Johnson, and while I live in Oakville, I've been a pediatrician at McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton for the past 15 years. Um, I wanted to actually uh, share slides, so I'm going to try to do that if people can let me know if they can sh see my screen, because I have a few um, slides to show you. That's certainly popped up. Can you? Uh... Yep. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so this is my first time uh, delegating at a city council meeting. I grew up in Montreal where my father was a city councillor, and uh, he was a city councillor there since I was in elementary school. I'm really grateful for this opportunity where my hard wiring to exercise my civic duty, my background as a scientist, and my lived experience as a black woman collide. The image on the screen is of my two boys and my baby nephew in their natural habitat, just chilling and having a good time. You can see their innocence depicted there, but unfortunately, these beautiful children are at increased risk of death compared to their white counterparts. 
Data shows that a black person in Toronto is nearly 20 times more likely than a white person to be involved in a fatal shooting by Toronto Police Services. Also, while we make up about 9% of Toronto's population, we account for 70% of fatal shootings. Hamilton is not immune to the problem of racism or how different populations are impacted differently as it relates to a number of health outcomes. Shortly after the murder of George Floyd, I was invited by the Canadian Pediatric Society to post on social media my perspective on what had happened. My reflections hopefully brought attention to the fact that while I am a highly educated physician living in an affluent area, I was actually terrified that my teenage son, who is already at increased risk because of the color of his skin, would be seen as more threatening by wearing a mask in the community. I wondered if this was on anyone's radar. Were the people making public health policy decisions aware of the impact of discrimination on health, on seeking care, on outcomes? Some communities have a difficult and traumatic historic legacy with the healthcare system. This must be considered when public health policies are being implemented. Vaccine hesitancy re related to the COVID-19 vaccine is a current example of this. The success of public vaccination programs depends on the vast majority of the public being immunized to achieve herd immunity. Among racialized communities, unfortunately, rates of hesitancy are as high as 50%. I understand that Hamilton has recently had to hire a number of vaccine ambassadors to help address this concerning issue. Ideally, the groundwork to address hesitancy should have been identified and addressed prior to vaccine arrival so that the most vulnerable communities would have had an, um, appropriate access to and comfort with this life-saving vaccine. This version of the Power Flower was put together by five BIPOC pediatricians at my hospital. We used it to illustrate the demographics, if you will, of the people who typically sit at decision-making tables within our institution. It turns out to be relatively consistent across all industry. The orange petals have been added to include those from equity seeking or historically marginalized groups. This slide is, uh, shows a number of different screen grabs from Toronto's uh, Board of Health website. It is clear that in addition to council members, there is representation from various community members. They also stipulate clearly that they are looking for diversity. And in fact, they happen to highlight youth as a demographic to be represented. And of course, as a pediatrician, I see this as an awesome way to engage young people. In 2018, Ontario Public Health um, standards were published with which list minimum expectations for the delivery of public health programs by all of Ontario's boards of health. You can see that integral to the framework of public health programs are things such as community engagement and building and strengthening relationships with communities. All institutions and organizations should strive to have their leadership reflect the diversity of the communities they serve. We all have blind spots and having diverse members with different experiences and expertise will help shed light on those blind spots and make planning more robust and inclusive. Of course, we need city councillors to be on Hamilton's Board of Health as they have expertise on various aspects of city processes and procedures. In addition, I believe that in order to meet its mandates, this board also needs to include community members, someone from healthcare, education, and more than one community member who identifies as BIPOC is essential. For public health initiatives to be successful, the voice of the community must be included in every step of the process. It is timely to consider a change of governance structure as the pandemic has amplified pre-existing health outcome disparities, which require innovative approaches to address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. And I'll turn to the board, if you could, yeah, thank you for unsharing that. Uh, if there are any questions of Dr. Johnson at this point. Not seeing anyone activated on our list. So I want to thank you, Doctor, for your, uh, oh, Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I very much appreciate you coming, coming in, Natasha. Um, that was an excellent presentation. And I guess my question for you is, um, I'm, I'm intrigued that this particular, if I understand um, 
the presentation and previous as well, that this particular restructuring has happened in other municipalities. Toronto has been referenced, but do you know how many other municipalities have um, uh, restructured along the similar lines to what you're, you've presented? Uh, okay. I am not sure the answer to that question. I know that there are more than one community. It looks like my colleague, Dr. Cassie Johnston, is saying six other communities. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Cassie. I, I appreciate that. That's excellent. Because I, 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 I um, you know, I, I listen very carefully to your presentation, and a lot of it just makes a lot of common sense, um, you know, to have the rest of the community, particularly those uh, areas that that um, you know are more diverse and and more at risk um, to have the expertise around the table uh, such as such as your yourselves you don't need to have every counselor around the table so I was very intrigued by um, what you just presented that showed you know a good mix of having six counselors set up more as a as a subcommittee so I very much uh, mr. mayor I very much appreciate the uh, the presentation and, and I think it is it is time to consider it uh, very much so especially as our city is growing and uh, particularly as it's growing in, in diversity thank you okay thank you uh, any other questions of dr. Johnson Councillor Farr thanks mr. mayor um, really good first time presentation. Uh, the pedigree from your uh, father's work uh, certainly has paid off. I appreciate it. I hope we can get a copy of it as well. And uh, Councillor Partridge's question is, uh, has uh, sparked one from me, uh, and maybe you or another delegate can assist through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, in those six other municipalities, ultimately the Board of Health, no, no matter how it may be made up, I, I did see your slide on the six councillors, the six community members, the one, can't remember, uh, in Toronto. Ultimately, Board of Health is still ratified by only council at their council meetings, correct? Or does it work a different way? Sorry, just unmuting myself. I am not certain the answer to that, but I see that Councillor Nan was nodding. So I'm assuming that the answer to your question is yes. Okay, well, some other delegate may be so. able to confirm and I appreciate again the presentation. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for your uh, presentation. Excellent presentation, as Councillor Farr pointed out. Uh, awesome first time effort and uh, I, I don't, I don't, I suspect you'll be doing more and uh, it's very much appreciated. So thank you. I'm going to turn now thank to you. Cassia Johnson, McMaster University as well. Hi. Good morning. Um, it's also my first time. Um, and so I hope I can be as eloquent as, as my colleagues. So good morning, everybody. And Mr. Mayor. My name is Dr. Cassia Johnson, and I'm a developmental pediatrician. So this means that I'm a kid's doctor that works with children and families that have a variety of learning, behavioral, and developmental disabilities. I was born and raised in Hamilton and have lived and worked in various wards across the city. And as a result, I'd like to acknowledge that Hamilton sits on the traditional territory of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee nations and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. My parents moved to Hamilton in the rockin' 60s and have worked as teachers for a combined over 50 years in the city. I have three brothers and no sisters. Yep, I'm the only girl. The experience as the only girl has given me insight into family life from a very specific point of view. But, uh, sorry, from a very specific point of view. But I didn't understand what it felt like to be one of the Johnson boys, some that excelled in sports and others that didn't. I didn't understand what it felt like to be one of the boys but not want to play bas basketball. I could sympathize, but I couldn't represent that idea in a conversation about something like funding of the boys' basketball program. It's not my fault that I didn't know how to talk about this. It's just that it wasn't my lived experience. As I stated, I am a physician, but when I've been a patient, I have learned so much more about what it can feel like to be listened to as a patient, to be respected, and to be understood. One of my brothers has a son with a disability. Can you imagine what it feels like to have a sister whose area of expertise is disability? 
for me as, as a sister, but also as a developmental pediatrician, it has been a journey in our family of me finding a space for my academic knowledge and learning about the lived experience of disability in my brother's family. When my brother has been invited and sitting at decision-making tables in the child disability world, system changes that are made have real life experience to guide them and understand the nuances of them. My brother's voice has created change in funding opportunities for children and their families, support programs, and structural recognition of the needs for lived experience to be a part of the decision-making process. You have heard from one of my colleagues and you will hear from many more today, community members and healthcare providers in Hamilton. We have a number of problems that public health has worked on for years and new ones that have emerged due to the experiences of the pandemic, such as vast disparities in the access to healthcare, vaccine hesitancy, and many more issues that we will see over the coming years as a result of the resource allocation that was needed during the pandemic. We have arrived at this conversation today because we don't see what we don't know. We work with our best intentions forward and we learn from one another. We, re we must remember that it's not our fault that we have biases, but when we miss the opportunity to make change, that is the true error in our ways. We must strive to be the best place to raise a child and age successfully. This is an opportunity to put Hamilton forward as a representative of change, a socially engaged forward-thinking city that is using this time of challenge to make change. But let's be honest and acknowledge that change can be uncomfortable for some. The unspoken concern here is that we are presenting the ideas that councillors will be stepping away from the Board of Health, to step away from work that they have been doing in earnest for years, and, and moving away from a space that may be important to them. This change must happen because it is what is right to do and can be messaged to constituents to show that councillors are forward thinking and are committed to being engaged in the community needs. This opportunity for city councillors to collaboratively, collaboratively design and implement health programs with community members at the table is based on the, health, the best health research from the, around the world. And it in fact is called collaborative co-design. It is the way forward. This is change with the citizens of Hamilton in mind and not about taking power away. It is a structural change that commits to and infuses health knowledge and analysis into the Board of Health to improve the health for all. Hamilton can provide high quality, cost conscious public services that contribute to a healthy, safe and prosperous community in a sustainable manner by diversifying our decision making tables and ensuring the community voice is actively present in all spaces. Let's be a part of courageous change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Much appreciated in terms of presentation. Uh, a good, great first effort as well. And uh, are there any questions of the Board of Health? Okay, I, I, I have a question. So if I could turn the chair over to uh, Vice Chair, Councillor Wilson. It seems to me that, you know, one of the questions that I, I kind of roll around in my mind is what <clears throat> the difference between what happens in the hospitals as opposed to what happens in the Board of Health in terms of preserving public health <clears throat> as uh, from a policy perspective uh, and having, you know, policies and procedures in place to protect against rabies, uh, you know, the whole range of things, right? I think I'm sure you're aware. I don't think we need to get into that. But there, but there is a, a distinct difference between what happens in a hospital which is somewhat independent from Board of Health, and what happens in the broader community in terms of policy around public health issues. How, how do you separate those two in your mind, or do you see them as separate? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't see them as separate because I think that people live and work and are healthy and unhealthy in a community and flow into the hospital when they need the tune-up and they're back in the community. 
So when those ideas are separated, we're dealing with a constituency that lives and flows between both spaces. And so there are definitely issues that sit in either space, but there are issues that flow between. And I think COVID has brought that in front of us in many ways as the community is working together with hospital representation around those things like vaccination, the big rollout of this and who and how and the person power between. And so I think the opportunity for each to carry their own subject matter, spaces and expertise, and then that crossover space is the important one so that we don't silo health. Health happens and unhealth, you know, you know, poor health happens in both places. So I hope that answers that question. Somewhat, yeah, you know, no, I, I do, I do, I don't disagree that uh, there is uh that there, there's an ins intersection point. I think the, the, the only challenge is when you're looking at a structural uh, change, then, then the Board of Health is one aspect of it. The other is, is very independently run uh, boards that, uh, that manage and operate uh, our hospitals with the province of Ontario and, and in fact, even some federal involvement. So uh, it, it sounds like, uh, I mean, I, 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 I guess I, don't want to oversimplify the issue in terms of public health policy as opposed to what happens in the hospital. I think there's some complexity there that needs to be uh, certainly considered and looked at. And uh, I do appreciate your answer, though, that there is an intersection point. So that's uh, that's certainly a good point. So I appreciate that. Uh, I have no further questions myself, but thank you for those answers. I appreciate them. Uh, Councillor Wilson, I'll take the chair back and I'll turn to Councillor Nan. Thank you through you, Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for being here this morning and thank you for your delegation. Um, so what is clear and what you're saying is um, a path towards not only evolving, you know, sometimes there's a, there's a tendency in conversations related to equity work that folks uh, misperceive that this is about creating change where change just for the sake of change. And what I hear you saying and what I appreciate in your approach is that this isn't about just jumping on a fad of making structural changes. This is actually about looking at this pandemic that we've just been walking through today and that we're still going to be walking through in terms of the recovery and taking what has been laid bare and saying, what can we do with this information? And recognizing that it does fundamentally speak to the need for structural change in decision making to ensure that our health policies are enacted in a way that uh, amount to health outcomes that serve all. Um, you also, I heard, spoke to what could be sometimes misconstrued as a taking away of power versus what you discussed, which was um, this is ultimately about co-designing and collaborating in order to put forward the most fulsome public health policy for a municipality. Um, and I just wanted to say that I appreciated that because I believe that that is a p bit of an educational component around health equity work that sometimes folks who don't come from marginalized communities or those who've been structurally and disproportionately and negatively impacted by this pandemic may not have the lived experience to understand. So I just, not so much questions because you you addressed any question I might have had uh, in your delegation regarding that. Just an appreciation for your approach and uh, for shedding some light on that. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate that, but we are at questions of the delegates, so uh, I know I don't want to get pulled into debate because I think everyone might want to start debating the issue uh, as opposed to uh, you know asking questions that might uh, uh, you know help clarify some of the statements that are being made today. I think we need to stick okay. in that space. Okay, Mayor, I, I appreciate that um, procedural point. And uh, I guess for me, it was, I had those questions as, as the delegate was speaking. So I guess in the form of a question, did I misconstrued anything that you were saying? Because I wasn't using this forum to debate. I was just really appreciating the discussion and engaging in it. Thank you. And we're going to save that discussion until uh, later. But uh, you know, if you want to answer that question, feel free. But we're uh, we're not debating at this point. We're just getting an understanding of your your presentation and some clarity around uh, the, the points you raise. Go ahead, Doctor. 
So I, I thank you for that um, question. Um, I, I think that the the um, the what we've learned in the pandemic is those issues that have been laid bare, as you say, are the the opportunities for change. And I think um, stepping into them, I mean, look at, we're, we're about to, I think, um, uh, I heard one of the, uh, um, Councillor Jackson say there are, you know, 550,000, um, you know, constituents that you have in Hamilton, and we're hoping to have them all vaccinated. And so I think the efforts that that is that is taking and and to address that with these unique things like public health has done with the um, vaccine um, ambassadors are are really showing us that there are these spaces and these opportunities um, to to do these uncomfortable but necessary things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I'm now going to turn to Councillor Clark. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good morning, Dr. Johnson. Um, I had the opportunity over the weekend um, to read Dr. Tam's report, and one of the sentences in her report, which really struck me, um, reads, the participation and engagement of social service, community organizations, business leaders, policymakers, both within and outside of the health sector are essential to any pandemic response. So can I ask a question? When I read Dr. Tam's report, it seems to be calling for structural change, not just with boards of health, but structural change across all jurisdictions, provincial governments, federal governments, cabinets, councils, boards. Did I interpret that report accurately? So I think pulling that one, um, thank you for the question. I, I'm, so, I'm not used to all the, <laughs> the, the formalities, but thank you for the question. I think what I'm, I'm hearing you say what you what you connected to is that this is not the only space that is being called on to make change to ensure um, we move forward from the pandemic and we improve health overall. Is that correct? Yes. And, uh, I just is, is your interpretation similar to mine or did I somehow misinterpret the report? I think my interpretation is the same because up to now we have um, placed health here and we've placed community services here, and it's the and it's the similar idea that people yes, yes. exist in all of those spaces. And so, making these structural changes um, is going to take a shift that is going to um, uh, take some some thought and take some various voices, diverse voices, to be. At the table because when we just make shifts with the same voices we we miss the 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 important of important time to make that change and we we miss the experiences and i and, and i think um, to turn to the to the voices of our indigenous brothers and sisters, we've we've seen that in 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 real time. And if we didn't know what happened in places like residential schools, we wouldn't know about the changes that were necessary. And that may be an extreme example, but it's a way to understand what having those diverse voices at the table in in enriches and guides us as we move forward. Councilor Clark, and thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I, I thank the doctor for her response because I, I think her response was apropos in terms of uh, the impacts of the pandemic. Uh, I know we were all concentrating right now on vaccines and, and staying safe, but the impacts of the pandemic uh, uh, has not been equal or equitable, and we're learning um, from our situation and from what people are experiencing. Um, can I ask a question? And, and I know you're a delegate and, and you're making requests here for us to look at this. Um, unfortunately, government is, sometimes moves slowly. And do you think there would be merit in having 
I'm going to use the term task force, Mr. Mayor, but that might not be the right term to, to look at the pandemic response in Hamilton and look at structural changes that are required and make recommendations for those structural changes, not just within our board of health, but I mean, we've seen issues outside of our board of health and outside of council that I, I think many of us would like to comment on at some point in the future, but because we're in the pandemic, we're, we're not doing it right now. It's you want everyone to have trust in public health as we go forward. So do you see, is there merit in having a committee, a forum to work on assessing the impacts and how, what types of structural change would be appropriate for us to move forward? I'm cognizant that if council does it, that there may be some that would would feel that we're we're not including the broader community so we need to have the entire community involved in that process i, I okay. your comments on that please thank you doctor uh thank you for the question um i think that we i as a constituent give you permission to make change quickly <laughs> my 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 heart <laughs> and I, I i recognize the the challenge in that but as a constituent i give you permission to 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 move forward because when I hear task force, I'll, I'll be very honest, there's a part of me that's always worried. Um, I have a great mentor that talks about paralysis by analysis. And so there is that space between analysis that's important. And then I hear you giving voice to, and I hear you opening the floor to having those uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> But then I hear task force and I hear the words paralysis. And so my the next part of my response is that these conversations are happening at um, tables like the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion and um, oh, you know no, just the, last week. Oh oh sorry. Um, and and the um, the uh, the other is the um, the Hamilton anti-racism um, board that's coming forward. So I think that these conversations are happening. What I hear in your question is an invitation for those voices to come to the tables of power and have a seat to, to be discussing the issues because those conversations are happening and it now needs to come to a place where people can infuse it with that opportunity, that, that power to make change. And so I don't think any of us would be um, uh, not open to the invitation to further conversation, but with a very specific um, job to amplify the work that is happening and the conversations that is happening and have them imbued with the power of decision-making tables such as yourself. Thank you. Thank you. That's clear. Thank you very much for that, that uh, very candid response. <laughs> um, I, um, my response, uh, 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 Mr. Mayor, would be I'm I'm always cognizant of the fact that I don't get to see through everyone's eyes their experiences, and so having those candid conversations to inform me, I can only speak for myself in this case, Dr. Johnson, so that I can make decisions for um uh, the aggregate of our entire community is very helpful otherwise i'm going in almost like a horse with blinders i can't see to the sides i'm only seeing what i'm experiencing and i think we need to be cognizant of that as we move forward i think we have to have more discussions um and i i I really feel, Mr. Mayor, that at some point we, we need to, to broaden our review of, of what happened with the pandemic and, and how we can improve upon our response. And I think that's what the delegates are really asking for on a go forward basis um, to improve our board of health. So I thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, you did very well today, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your comments and they were most informative. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. It's uh, It's been a delight listening to all these uh, delegates, and I hope that the ones that are 
going to uh, come after you. Don't apologize at the beginning for being a first time because um, it's uh, just been so informative and enriching. So thank you. Um, I would like to, if I if I could, uh, touch on two points. And going back to Mayor Eisenberger's question um, about um, perhaps um, what we perceive to be the solitudes in healthcare uh, decision making, practice, and delivery, uh, that of the, uh, the hospitals, um, and that of um, uh, the Board of Health. And I'm wondering if if I could try. Um, and likely fall, uh, but to endeavor to describe my perception and whether you can tell me as a practitioner and as a, a researcher and as a mother, a black woman, whether I'm accurate. Um, when I think of hospitals, I'm thinking of um, primarily, but not singularly, a tailpipe in that the hospitals are the recipients of our um, our social determinants in our in our inequities in our community, and they are on the receiving end of dealing with our uh, successes and, frankly, our failures in prioritizing um, what we value, but more importantly, who we value, and the design of our city, the delivery. I also, I think, understand that how a person is treated and assessed in that hospital is another discussion of um, inequities practiced, given that lack, that absence of lived experience and who they are. But leaving that aside, so if the hospital is the recipient and the Board of Health is um, like the, uh, it has a, a significant role in defining and identifying what are those lived experiences um, and how they are influenced um, by race, by gender, um, uh, by income, by where they live, who they live with. Um, and the type of conditions within which they live and how we focus on that, those social determinants, and therefore will affect ultimately that tailpipe of the hospital. Am I, is it, I just, could you comment on, on, on that for me? Because to me, it speaks to the importance of, of a board of health getting those priorities right. And thank you. Thank you. Doctor. Thank you for the question. Um, I think that's a, um, whether it's it, it, it's a tailpipe or, or a conduit or um, it's, it's that they are related and that the Board of Health has influence um, more so in one space than another. And I think opportunities to focus on um, those that are at uh, highest risk and opportunities to focus um, on those um, that are experiencing the, the the most significant health outcomes is the, the is the um, mechanism and and um, real uh, point of the the health board. So yes, they they are connected, um, but definitely the board of health has a greater influence on the larger constituency um, and the health of the larger constituency and those that are most at risk. Thank you. And, and on the matter of um, that, uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, what was that phrase you used, uh, paralysis by analysis? <laughs> I have to remember that one. Um, the, the tension that exists um, for members of our community um, who are always, uh, I mean, the Campbell, my understanding of the commission brought on by the experience of SARS um, already has identified um, these inequitable outcomes. And I, I certainly feel the need for a community conversation about these realities so we can change 
policy on all fronts, but I'm, I'm sure as um, it must be also frustrating to have yet another study um, to confirm what has already been um, officially confirmed. Could you just comment on that that tension of of needing to 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 get the public behind something, uh, but the hurry up and wait for those particularly who uh, uh, suffer inequities because of of race or income, etc. Thank you. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, it, it's a bit of a, it was a bit of a glib statement, paralysis by analysis, because I think that the example of collecting race-based data in COVID gave us that very specific insight. So there is an importance in collecting the data to understand. The paralysis is when we spend time looking at that data through the, the, the um, previously generated lenses. Right, And so when we look at that data, the, the data is important to have, but when we look at that data through the equity-based lenses, that's when it gives us that opportunity to, it's not even hurry up and wait, but it's make change. Mm -hmm. And and so, I mean, I think to clarify, um, I'm named as being a delegate from McMaster, but half of my clinical time is spent working in the community and various uh, spaces in the community. Um, and so I, I, I am not a bound to that academic center and, and the mindset that may that often gets presented as the ivory tower to analyze that data. And so I'm I'm working, you know, in the communities and see the the outcome of those experiences may be um, related to me differently than it's related to other people because of my own race. Mm -hmm. And so it is paralysis by analysis, but it's it, the paralysis comes when we don't take the opportunity to shift the lens that we are using for our analysis. Thank you. That was, thank you, time. Dr. Johnson. That was really helpful. I appreciate that, uh, that very much. Thank you. Thank Great, you, thank Mayor. you. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Mr. Mayor and Dr. Kasia Johnson. Nice to meet you virtually and hope someday when normalcy returns, I can meet you in person as well. Um, You've taken my question I had for Mr. Lyndon George. You've taken it now to a more, I believe, clear level. And I, at some point, we're going to have a fulsome, honest, comprehensive debate, Mr. Mayor, over uh, where it seems the delegate's theme is going. So to be clear, Dr. Johnson, I listened carefully. And with the structural change you're talking about that may be uncomfortable for some, you are ultimately then looking at the 16 elected members of council that currently serve on behalf of our taxpayers and citizens of this great city, you are ultimately looking at some structural change that may, if you will, displace an X number of them from the decision-making of Board of Health so that X number of important community members can take their place, have that equal vote, in ultimately deciding what's best for the health of the community. Through you, Mr. Mayor, and if I'm incorrect, have misinterpreted, please correct me, Dr. Johnson, but that's what I've heard very carefully. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks for the question again. Okay, so the other thing in my brutal honesty is that I am not a politician and understanding the rules of who can vote and how I say through Mr. Mayor and not through Mr. Mayor and all those things are not a part of my, my lived experience or my lexicon. And I say it in a teasing way, but it's to, to understand that that's why you have a delegation in front of you that'll be putting this motion forward. And I'm learning in this process also that it's when we have come together with all of our different experiences, Mr. George not being a physician, but being somebody that's engaged in the community um, with a different language. And, and I think the other part that I heard from Mr. George bringing to this question is, from now until the time of bringing forward the motion, we will be engaging with each one of you, hopefully, to be able to learn what some of those maybe rules are, what some of those ideas are, what some of those concerns are, so that we come forward with a motion that is in, endorsed and understood by all. Because 
because for you to know, my understanding is those boards of health that do have a mixed model are very much, um, they're each different and they arrived through these uncomfortable and important conversations with council and with members. And so there isn't a provincial structure for how you do public health in a mixed board, right? And so each community has had these conversations. So I think it'll be important. And I, what I'm hearing in your questions is a real concern about being elected and the importance of being elected and the responsibility that that brings and the importance that that brings, balancing that with um, shaking things up and bringing in a new perspective and having constituents that haven't arrived at the table in the same way and their responsibility and their safety in being able to make decisions that are representative. And these are w the conversations that these other mixed boards have had to understand how they do that in the res the responsible way, in the, the same important way that you feel that you're bringing to the that the the current health uh, uh, board structure. Dr. Johnson, thank you for your um, for your thoughtful and fulsome answer. And by the way, thank you very much for all you've been doing medically throughout this pandemic at McMaster. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next up is uh, Dr. Ruth Rodney, uh, York University. I see you there. Or is it, I'm sorry, did I get it right? I said Dr. Ruth Rodney. I'm not sure that that was accurate, but it's Ruth Rodney. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And, um, so uh, just as you said, my name is Ruth Rodney. I am an assistant professor in the School of Nursing at the Faculty of Health at York University. Um, I'm also a Hamiltonian who has lived in numerous areas throughout the city, um, but I'm currently living in Ward 7 and I'm a mother uh, of a little boy. I also recognize that I am on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations. I've been a registered nurse for the past 17 years. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Somebody Very said much. hello. <clears throat> can hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Um, yeah. Okay. okay, great. So, um, yes, I've been a, a nurse for the past 17 years. Uh, um, entering academia, I worked at the General Hospital Emergency Department for 10 years. Prior to that, I worked at St. Joe's, primarily on their clinical teaching unit. Um, and while in nursing school, I worked as a ward clerk at St. Joe's and have also worked as a PSW at Shalom Village. Um, so I've been immersed in the medical field and have served my community in this capacity for half of my life. However, I transitioned into academia, realizing the importance of having data to inform population health, particularly for my community, which historically has either been misrepresented or underrepresented in research. While I'm sure that City Council is often faced with difficult decisions, what we are presenting here today is not one of them. This one decision um, definitely would be a win for everyone, um, which in turn means that the health and well being of Hamiltonians will improve. So I want to give you an example. A 2013 report from the Canadian Nurses Association provides several examples of how nursing led or nursing integrated population health services improves health. One such example included Hamilton. Um, and using a referral process, a team of seven nurse practitioners and one registered nurse um, at the Hamilton Niagara Haldeman Brand Lynn provided clinical services to 86 long-term care homes. So while making over 5,000 resident visits over a one-year period, the team avoided over 39,000 potential hospital days and over 2,000 emergency room visits. I use this example for two reasons. One, to illustrate the impact that public health can have on our hospitals that struggled with capacity long before the pandemic ever hit. And secondly, to show that if nurses can impact health on this level, having a seat on this board will add expertise and experience in addressing the complexities of health in ways that only those who have firsthand experience can provide. I would also say that as a black nurse who has been called a nigger by patients, who has been asked where I was born and when I was in, they say, good for you, um, who has been told that I speak so well, who has had pens and pencils stuck in my hair by colleagues because my hair is so cool. 
um, and who has breathed a sigh of relief when I began at the ER and saw another Black nurse because her presence meant that I didn't have to shoulder the sole responsibility of constantly responding to racism and that someone else would understand how I felt. Having diverse representation on this board says to racialize frontline workers who are often the only ones or one of few, um, that there is greater chance they have support at the decision-making tables in others who can understand and appreciate the added layer of race that has made healthcare for many in this city inequitable, inaccessible, and oftentimes intimidating. It also gives the community greater confidence in the city when they see someone on the board who looks like them. So as I stated earlier, I worked in the ER for 10 years and the majority of patients I saw were not racialized. My colleague and I have often asked ourselves, where do black people and other racialized people in the city go to access healthcare, if they even do at all? Every healthcare practitioner you speak to have those cases that stay with them. And in the interest of time, I will not share the one that I'm thinking about, but reflecting on that woman's case, I want this board to know that the responsibility you have, particularly for those Hamiltonians who are marginalized in a multitude of ways, demands that we work together to improve public health within the city. In healthcare, we make difficult decisions all the time. And you can rest assured that making this change will mean that you are better supported and informed to make the necessary decisions to improve population health in Hamilton. Adding healthcare professionals on the Board of Health not only makes sense, but it will make a positive difference. Um, and I'll stop there in the interest of time. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, presentation as well. Uh, any uh, questions of Board of Health? Not seeing anyone on the speakers list at the moment. So some, Ruth, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Very much appreciated. We have a number of other uh, uh, videos that uh, are going to be presented uh, starting right about now. So you're welcome to stay to watch those. And then we will wrap up our presentation portion uh, after the one, two, three, four videos, starting with Madeline Verhozevic. So, Madam Clerk, if you want to start the next video, I'd appreciate that. It's Legislative Coordinator Paparella who is running the videos this morning, and they will be right up. All right. We're having some audio challenges at the moment. Lauren, I'm not. I'm not hearing it. So, uh, are we having a? Yeah, we're just having an issue here. Just hold okay. on one moment, just... please. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll be we'll be with you in a sec. And someone asked about quorum. Do we have quorum at the, at the moment? Um, Not that we need it for presentations, but. Hello, my name is Madeline Verhopsek. I'm a physician and resident of the city of Hamilton. I live in Ward 1. I'm proud my, to call myself a Hamiltonian. This is my chosen city, having grown up in Richmond Hill, north of Toronto. And I came here over 20 years ago for university and never left. In my years working as a physician in this city, I have seen and had the deep privilege and responsibility to care for patients from every walk of life. 
I look after primarily people who have blood conditions. This can range anywhere from anemia, something common like iron deficiency, all the way through to blood clots and more serious and complex issues. The patients that I provide care to, as I said, come from across the whole spectrum of our society, from individuals who may be top high profile lawyers and CEOs uh, through to physician and other healthcare worker colleagues. And then as well, a number of the patients who I provide care to do not have those advantages. They may come from financially disadvantaged backgrounds or current place in life. They may be black, indigenous, or from other racialized communities where to varying degrees through their lives and at various points in their healthcare journey, they have encountered challenges. What I think is so important and in fact exciting about this discussion that we're having today about the Board of Health is that we find ourselves in a very unique time in history at the one year mark of a global COVID-19 pandemic where we see these social determinants of health not only being a factor that affects how someone navigates their own personal health challenges, but also being a risk factor for those individuals having those health challenges in the first place. We have ample data across the country and in Hamilton specifically to show us that those individuals who are challenged in some of these very important social determinants of health are at higher risk of COVID. And so we think, well, that's that individual that they've got a lot on their plate. How, how can we help that situation? But we realize that in fact, it's not just a matter of how can we help or should we help? But with something like a pandemic, this has really shone a bright light on the fact of how interconnected and how interdependent we all are. Those individuals who are disadvantaged, who don't have those same advantages, who are from marginalized populations, if they're not well looked after, no one is well looked after. And, and something that's infectious in nature really highlights that to us. So with this discussion that is being now raised about the Board of Health, how are we going to make the best decisions for our community? Well, sometimes and in a lot of settings, the municipalities have decided that in order to optimally provide best decision making for their communities, they're actually going to reach into the community and get formal representation from the community. In a way, this is just a first step, but I would argue that this is a necessary step. We are so appreciative to City Council and the Board of Health for um, entering into these conversations with us and considering what the future might look like for our City of Hamilton Board of Health. And we really look forward to ongoing dialogue and discussion with you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Our next per, uh, video will be from Timothy O'Shea, McMaster University. Hi, my name is Dr. Tim O'Shea, and I'm here to speak in support of the need for structural reform at the Hamilton Board of Health, as well as including community voices on the board. I am an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at McMaster uh, and work in the Division of Infectious Disease. I also work uh, primarily in the community, uh, providing care through various different organizations, including the Shelter Health Network and the Hamilton Social Medicine Response Team, um, primarily focused on providing care to people who are experiencing homelessness or are affected by poverty, mental health, or addictions. My 
uh, reason for delegating on this particular issue is that I feel strongly about the importance of con including diverse voices when making decisions around uh, healthcare policy. Um, as a member of the, the Division of Infectious Disease in the Department of Medicine at McMaster, as well as a member of the various organizations that I work with in the community, I've been lucky enough to be at many tables that have discussed different health policies uh, that have related to a number of different issues in our community. Most prominently, I've been involved with decision making around the opioid epidemic, as well as the uh, recent COVID epidemic that has um, gripped our community over the last year. In my experience at these tables, the decisions that are made and the effectiveness of these decisions are greatly enhanced by having diverse voices at the table particularly having community voices, uh, voices of people who are affected directly by the policies that are put in place at the table. At this point, the Board of Health does not have broad representation from the community. The danger in setting up an organization such as the Board of Health uh, to not have broad representation is that decisions are made with good intentions that are either ineffective or uh, in fact, sometimes harmful to the communities that they're intended to help. At HamSmart in particular, we've, we have centered the voice of the community in the decisions that we make and have invited voices of peer support workers and individuals with lived experience with the disease conditions that we're trying to combat to the tables where we're making our uh, plans and decisions uh, to uh, intervene. Again, in my experience, this has led to a much richer understanding of what needs to be done, and as well has provided context into what actually works. It is my hope that the Board of Health takes these recommendations to invite more diverse voices to the table, to include representatives from the community in the decision making that directly affects their health and their well being in order to make decisions that are effective, make decisions that are of benefit to the entire community. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you. I, I assume the background noise was on the video. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Right. It was okay, on the video. and our next presenter is uh, Claire Bodkin, McMaster University. We'll be right with you. Thanks for your patience. Oh, here we go. Hi, my name is Claire Bodkin. Um, I really wish that I could be there with you today and delegating uh, live, but unfortunately I'm not able to do that. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to present over video. For a little bit of context, I am a physician. I'm completing my residency training right now in family medicine here in Hamilton. And I live in the East End and own a home in Ward 4. Um, in terms of some of the perspectives that I'm bringing to, uh, you know, what I'm sharing today, I have, I grew up in London, Ontario, and uh, also lived in Toronto, and both of those cities have different models for their, their public health boards than we have here in Hamilton. And then I also served as a, a director on the board of directors for a community health centre. So I have, um, you know, some appreciation for the role that strong governance can can play in ensuring that health and healthcare and, and public health meets the needs of the population that it serves. One of the things that I've seen, um, both in terms of the, the Board of Health Governance in Toronto and London, and then also in terms of the Community Health Centre that I was on the board for, is that a strong board requires having different voices and different skills and different perspectives at the table in order to ensure that the strategic uh, direction and decisions of whatever the organization or service is reflects um, reflects those different experiences and perspectives and, and really meets the need of a population that is not a monolith, but in fact, very rich and diverse. 
So as a healthcare worker, I've been intimately involved in, in two epidemics. One is the opioid poisoning epidemic, uh, which has been, you know, really escalating since 2016. And certainly um, in the last year, we've seen deaths higher than they've, than they've ever been before. Uh, from opioid overdose and poisoning. And then the COVID epidemic, which I think every healthcare worker has been, um, you know, touched by and involved in across the world. And both of these epidemics have illuminated the role of structural determinants of health. For example, we know that um, migrant workers are more likely to get COVID. We know that people who are uh, racialized are more likely to get COVID and die from COVID. We know that people who are deprived of housing are more likely to contract COVID and also more likely to die from COVID. And then when we look at the overdose numbers, we also know that um, Indigenous people who live in Canada are disproportionately affected by uh, overdose death. So my delegation is, is you know, I only have a few minutes. I can't get into all of the, the reasons that is. Um, but alongside those two epidemics, then there's been these really important conversations around racism and, um, you know, the, the impact of racism on the safety, the health, the joy, the lives of black and indigenous and, and other people of color um, in all of our communities, including here in Hamilton. So with that context and knowing that after SARS, we saw a big reorganization of health services and particularly public health services, I think we're coming up on a time where there is the interest, the appetite, the willingness to change and say, how can we do things better? And I think that for Hamilton to ensure that our public health services actually proactively meet the needs of everyone in our community, but particularly people who are... Um, you know, who are disproportionately impacted by uh, structural determinants of health, people who um, experience racism, people who are deprived of housing, people who, um, you know, are living with the far-reaching harm of colonization, uh, to ensure that those people uh, are all cared for in our city and cared for uh, in our public health services, we need to change how our board of health is actually governed and how that strategic leadership piece um, is done. And, and that means, you know, obviously continuing to have a role for our elected officials who Hamiltonians have said, yeah, this is who we want representing us in, in making these decisions, but also finding ways to access the other skills and strengths that exist in our community and make sure that the board of health uh, is actually representative of and reflective of the community it serves. Not because this is a nice to have, but because this is actually a stronger governance model that ensures our public health services meet the needs of everyone in Hamilton and takes that very important, uh, you know, equity focused lens on, on the delivery of public health services as well. Um, thanks so much for listening to what I have to say and, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing where this conversation goes. All right, thank you to that presenter. And the next uh, presentation is Dr. Mark Walton, McMaster University as well. Hello, oh, my name is uh, Mark Walton. Uh, I am a doctor, MD, FRCSC, and I'm a pediatric surgeon who works at the Children's Hospital. I'm a professor of surgery and professor of uh, pediatrics. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity to uh, offer this submission uh, regarding the consideration of <clears throat> changing the uh, composition of the uh, Board of Health. Um, I moved to uh, <clears throat> Hamilton and specifically Ancaster, Ward 12 in 1993 and um, from Ottawa and have uh, uh, come to love the city and its uh, environment. Um, I'm really proud to live here, and um, uh, and I think uh, when I became aware of the uh, possibility of consideration of changing the composition of the board, <clears throat> I, I thought this seemed like the right thing to do. Um, uh, as you may know, I'm a white male settler, um, and uh, I acknowledge that privilege. Um, but I must say the last three to four years has been a real eye-opener for me. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, truth and reconciliation, uh, the calls to action, um, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd's death, uh, Joyce Eshquan's uh, death. And so we have much 
uh, work to do in terms of um, uh, equity uh, um, amongst all of our um, uh, citizens. And um, so I, you know, I, I want to be part of that and recognize my privilege that I have perhaps an ability to change things. I understand the Board of Health is essentially constitutes the councillors uh, in Hamilton. And uh, uh, what I would suggest is it may be time, given what's happened over the last <clears throat> three to four years, that it's time to consider uh, a diversification of the representation on the Board of Health to include uh, community members uh, and community members that have expertise in health and uh, health equity. In my uh, clinical work uh, as a pediatric surgeon, I see the social determinants of health and their impact um, uh, almost every day. Um, we have uh, many uh, new immigrants to the country that are challenged by uh, uh, language issues and other challenges. And I think it's important that we recognize those and, and uh, try and uh, position ourselves uh, to uh, put uh, structures in place that are of assistance. Um, you know, I, I often see people struggling, and uh, I think a more diverse board uh, and may well serve the community better. Um, and it's an opportunity to get local people involved instead of having uh, sort of public health officials coming from outside of this area to, um, to uh, uh, take over the Board of Health. Uh, it may also give, uh, well, certainly we recognize this within um, hospitals and, and universities, that a diverse group of voices may well um, uh, really assist in uh, decision making uh, and make uh, the board even more responsive than it already is um, to uh, the environment and to the local community. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I think this is an opportunity. It's, uh, and uh, I would challenge you to consider this fully. Um, the, uh, and it's an opportunity to really make uh, health equity uh, more of a reality than it is in, in, in um, uh, Hamilton. Um, and I, lastly, I'd like to thank you all for your uh, dedication to uh, public service and um, that this uh, change may well um, lead to uh, even more uh, success within our healthcare system. COVID has certainly brought this to light uh, <clears throat> with delivery of uh, vaccines and also um, it's highlighted some of the, the disadvantages that are felt by equity seeking groups. So I thank you for uh, considering this uh, and I'm, I apologize I can't be there in person um, because of uh, uh, clinical care commitments. Um, but I hope uh, this can lead to an active discussion about next steps. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. <clears throat> Walton and all the presenters uh, today. Could I have a, a motion to receive all the presentations that were uh, brought forward today? Motion to approve by Councilor Marula, seconded by Councilor Vanderbeek. Thank you, all in favor? of receiving them all formally. Uh, electronic vote is popping up. If you can, please do. If not, let me know. Councilor Mirola's hands, thumbs up. Councilor Partridge, thumbs up. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. City Hall has to be the driest building on earth. Lauren, you'll let me know that that's approved. And while we're at it, I mean, I wonder if it's in our interest, given all the presentations today, to uh, to hear from uh, uh, public health, and or at least ask them to to you know do some preliminary thinking about what was presented today, uh, in terms of maybe a, a report coming to the next board of health maybe identifying uh, some of the changes that have happened in different boards of health uh, across the province uh, when we actually decided uh, to take on this format, uh, how and why. Uh, so uh, I think that's a reasonable thing to ask of staff. I'm not sure that uh, 
staff is prepared to answer any questions on it today. But Dr. Richardson, while you're up next, in any, in any event, any preliminary thoughts on obviously a lot of information we've heard today and some thoughts around uh, where we are and where we might go. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. If I could, um, it was just a joy to listen to so many sharing so clearly about governance, the importance of diversity, and uh, and just how much um, of a factor it's it's become profiled as through COVID, but it is so much more of an issue than COVID alone. This is about a fundamental determinant of health in terms of, of um, how healthy people are and also about how governance plays a role in that. And so uh, that was a, a pleasure to listen to. Um, I do uh, want to say a few things in terms of history and then really you're right, Mr. Mayor, it would be best probably to come back with a report that's more uh, conducive to it all. But um, if we go way back, there's a long history in terms of public health development in Ontario going back to the 1800s and essentially municipalities became boards of health back um, around the turn of the century. This is a, a, a quite a long standing thing. And in Ontario, um, as things went forward in bit the 1940s, 1950s, you start to see amalgamation of boards of health and the creation of independent boards of health. And so that's where we have a number, I think it's around, oh, it would be about 25 right now that are independent boards of health where they are, um, they often have, they have always have municipal members on them, but are, do not have uh, a reporting relationship to any particular municipal council. Um, then there are the six uh, regions, Halton, Durham, York, Peel, um, where you have regional councils who continue to be uh, municipal boards of health, for lack of another uh, better word, uh, today and where uh, that is solely who is on them. And you also have um, Toronto and Ottawa, as the presenters uh, discussed, who at the time post-SARS, uh, well, Toronto had had a long-standing history with its amalgamation, but Ottawa in particular is an example where with the findings from the Campbell Commission, the Walker Commission, the Walker Panel, you know, there are numerous numerous reports that were written around that point and that recommended some changes to governance for public health um, in Ontario. And so Ottawa chose to change its Board of Health so that it was more like Toronto, where you have uh, municipal uh, community members as well as municipal representatives on the Board of Health who make almost every decision related to how those, those public health units are, um, are governed. Uh, ex with the exception of the appointment of, of staff and um, budget. And so there's, there's you know, specifics further on that, but uh, that's how Toronto and Ottawa in particular operate. Um, and uh, they are the only ones that are kind of that hybrid model in that way. So we um, did debate these things as a Board of Health. You had the uh, former uh, councils have over the years as uh, the Walker panel came forward and Naylor Report and many others. And uh, the idea of having a separate committee or um, asking for changes to provincial legislation, which is what would be required if it was entirely to move to a, a different governing structure like Toronto and Ottawa has, have been discussed in the past. And certainly we can bring back uh, an overview of, of what um, it requires and what it uh, what discussions have been held previously. Okay, thank you. And I think yeah, I, I kind of an overview report on the history and where we are and <clears throat> what uh, some reflection on the pause on the changes that are being advocated for would be, uh, I think, helpful for a future board meeting. I have Councillor Partridge and I think Councillor Farr. So Councillor Partridge, you're uh, up next. Yes, Councilor. thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, um, you know, I, I, I really appreciated the discussion this morning um, and, the, and the presenters that came forward. Um, I think, you know, it, it definitely makes some sense to put a formal motion together, um, just as, as uh, Elizabeth has outlined on the, inf there's so much information out there, sounds like there's a few different models, um, and it's important that we get the right one to work for our city as well. So I would, uh, I would certainly be happy to second a motion that, um, you know, that we bring back more information on, on, you know, the structures that are out there, potential structures that would work for city, what would be involved, what kind of expertise we would need on, um, you know, and, uh, and, and the number of counselors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see this, uh, this discussion happening today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate okay, it. Thank you. Councillor Farr. 
Yeah, I'm happy to hold off on my questions and just go with the direction you've uh, suggested, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'm sure we'll get lots of answers in short order. And it, thanks to all the delegates. Appreciate it. Okay, so thank you all. And so uh, I, I think I think it's direction to staff. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure it's a formal motion required, but we can do one if you like. But yes, doctor, go ahead. If I could, Mr. Mayor, just a couple of things I neglected to, to remind Council of is also the context of public health modernization. And so we know there's a very active discussion at the provincial level in terms of the future of public health. Um, and uh, that is uh, something that has been pending for some time. And as some had said during the discussion, it has been put off uh, while we deal with COVID, but is we've been told all through that it's a discussion that remains live. Uh, the other piece is just in terms of expectations for a report um, to bring back an overview of, of what has happened, we could do very quickly, um, essentially rejuvenating some of the things we've done in the past to go into a long discussion of the various models and their pros and cons and, and that sort of piece. I would just suggest that a broader group really needs to look at that um, and perhaps work with governance uh, subcommittee in terms of looking at what might be helpful to bring forward to the Board of Health in their, in their discussions. I think staff alone in sort of working that through um, while well, we can provide you with some information to really bring sort of the pros and cons from a, from a robust viewpoint would be better done perhaps by that subcommittee. Okay, that's a thought. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to turn to Councillor Jackson and then Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Jackson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, look, Mr. Mayor, um, I'm willing to, if this is part of a formal referral motion to Dr. Richardson to come back with options, um, upside, downside. But I want to make a clear right now, Mr. Mayor, a couple of things. Um, uh, I hope that status quo, I think that and it wasn't said today, so I'm gonna say it. I think our Board of Health under Dr. Richardson's leadership and the EOC team overall with yourself, General Manager Paul Johnson, Dr. Richardson, the entire team, have done an enormous yeoman's job getting us through this awful, unprecedented pandemic the last 12 months. So I wanna state that uh, for the record today because I kept hearing today from the delegates, and I, I say this very respectfully, and it's a democracy. They bring in their talents and opinions to the table of, I kept hearing structural change. And so when I'm hearing that, it's about potentially then taking the 16 current members of council, if we're gonna go in an optional direction that uh, will be brought back by Dr. Richardson. Again, I'm hoping status quo will also be part of what she brings back as well. If we're going in potentially hypothetically in that direction, uh, I will, I'll say, say right now, Mr. Mayor, because the discussion is now beginning, I will not abdicate my responsibility as a member of council who's duly elected to sit on all the standing committees of council and on our board of health. And as you know, Mr. Mayor, a number of years ago, we established the Board of Health and some greater independence of the Board of Health uh, because of the Walkerton report, the Campbell, Justice Campbell's report from 0304, et cetera, and what we went through with swine as well, the H1N1 in 2008. So, Mr. Mayor, I just want to get that on the record because if there is, if there seems to be an intent and a desire to have this report brought back and it's moving us in the direction a potentially a community members, non-elected, equal voting decision-making voices at this table. I'm sorry, I'm stating for the record right now, I cannot support that. I will not abdicate my responsibilities to the constituents of Ward 6 who elected me to look after, to the best of my ability, the entire corporation of the city of Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. And and Dr. Richardson, is there provincial legislation setting out the makeup of Board of Health in places like Hamilton? Through you, Mr. Mayor, there is legislation uh, setting out the makeup of Boards of Health um, and exactly where that legislation resides depends on the structure of the Board of Health. So for example, in Toronto, it's part of the City of Toronto Act. Um, overall, it's in the Health Promotion Health Protection Promotion Act in terms of who makes up uh, each Board of Health. So it, it sits in a few different places. So is Hamilton in the slot where members were counseled as the Board of Health in the legislation? 
Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, Hamilton's in a spot where council is the Board of Health, according to the legislation. Council, of course, can strike any subcommittee that it chooses in order to advise it on its uh, duties, but it is the Board of Health. So we can't make wholesale changes to the structure of the Board of Health without provincial approval? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm no lawyer, but that's my understanding. Okay, because that makes a big difference where we go. And, um, you know, if we if we don't have the legislative authority to... Uh, to bring on citizens or other people to the Board of Health, then you know I, I think that delineates us down pretty quick that we may be looking at some advisory group. Because you know, I just witnessed it with the Conservation Authorities Act for the province come in and told us to dismiss all our citizen appointees and go only with members of council because they wanted the accountability that their electorate put us there. And, and so there's five members of the, and very capable members of the public on the Hamilton Conservation Authority, and we were told to dismiss them. And, and that's been delayed now until the uh, new council is made up and there's a resolution going to council asking the province to reconsider that for Hamilton. But, it, you know, if the expectation of the delegates today is that we're going to have some members of council step down and bring in, whether it's doctors or some other community members, when legislatively we can't do that, um, I, I think that narrows us down pretty quick to what we can and can't do. So I put that out for everyone's thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Marula. Can't hear you just yet. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. Just Thank quickly you. to you, to um, Dr. Richardson, if my memory serves me correctly, Back in 2000, um, City Council was given delegated authority to decide whether we, how the, the makeup of the, the the Board of Health. We decided to take the the council route, uh, but many other opportunities throughout the province uh, opted out because now again, I, back in the day when I worked at the Brant County Health Unit, they had district health councils, which um, in the late 80s were vibrant, but I believe that was amended uh, years later to develop what we have today. Can you just refresh our memory on the history and chronologically where we were under the district health unit model versus today? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I think you may be uh, bringing together two co different concepts. So district health yeah. councils have were put in place as planning advisory bodies to the provincial government um, and looked at planning hospitals and, and care um, from that perspective. Okay. Boards of health, which govern public health units, have been in place. They are the ones that, as I said, have been present in Ontario since the late 1800s. For municipal boards of health with over 800 of them actually at that time. Um, and then municipalities, as they amalgamated, they would usually you know, reduce the number of health units that were there accordingly until right. about the 1940s, 1950s, when there was actually some work done um, out of the U.S. that encouraged Ontario to make some changes. There was some funding that came actually from the U.S to um, structure these regional boards of health. And so these were set up in most of the province, except for those where they were uh, they were maintained under this sort of municipal leadership. And so for Hamilton in 1974, um, when it, it became the region, that is when we moved from the Hamilton-Wentworth Board of Health, which was um, a different sort of body to the regional council becoming the Board of Health for all of Hamilton-Wentworth. And then with the uh, changes that happened in 2000, that uh, power went from the regional council to city council. Okay, and then we were given an option, though, at that time to, to de determine which route we would take. Would we, as a council, take on the role of the public health, or will we make, uh, develop or comp put together a group that could be similar to what they have in other municipalities that don't use their, their city council? So... I believe we do have the delegated authority if we request the province to change the makeup of our public health department or public health committee that we, we can request of Ontario to allow us to do so. Now, through you, uh, Dr. Richardson, perhaps legal can uh, expand upon it, but I believe we do have the authority based on my my memory, if it serves me correctly, we decided to use council um, as the Board of Health. So if we can expand upon that, that'd be a little helpful in understanding where we were, where we are, and where we're headed in the future. 
Right. So, so I, I would, I would assume that would be part of a, you know, an upcoming report. Right. You're not, not looking for the answer right now because I oh, think. Oh no, absolutely not. Legalities, yeah. right? And then there's a the question of how do the lens fit into all of this, right? Can, can I also expand upon now that we've determined the history? I think it's important that we look at the request seriously, and I'll explain why. We as a council did a heck of a job with COVID, but imagine if we had a different slant ideology uh, ideologically on council we really could have had a, 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 a lot of drama let's put it that way if the majority of council would have sided with some of the radical right-wing stuff we could have had a circus throughout that entire period of time because we have a political body responsible for what i believe experts should be responsible for so i appreciate your time and i thank you uh, we, we've been well guided by our public health team, in fact. So I think that's uh, that's I think that's a given throughout this that they've done, uh, you know, a terrific job through our COVID process. And I, I don't know that that's ultimately the argument. I think it's it's more broad than that. Um, so uh, I appreciate everything they've done. And hopefully First Ontario Centre is working uh, seamlessly today. Uh, we have Councillor Nan first time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, on the topic, and thank you also to Dr. Richardson for that quick overview. Um, uh, I think that I would agree with my other colleagues who would appreciate a report back that is a little bit more fulsome, that does give us a sense of what the other various models are that have been used across Ontario, where they have achieved legislative authority to address the structural changes that I think this delegation is asking us to consider seriously. Um, so I would be putting my vote towards that in terms of making sure that that uh, report is something that is robust enough to help address some of the questions and concerns that uh, Board of Health members may have in terms of the pros and cons of those various models, but also um, very clearly about whether or not uh, those other models have relinquished any responsibility of a, of a council to its residents, because it's my belief that those other models don't do that um, as the the Fund, uh, the final authority does come back to council. Um, so there's hybrids and there's multiple options, and I think it's it's valuable for us to explore those um, and, and to have that information brought back to us robustly. It does make me concerned from a timeline perspective uh, about whether that's available to us, um, given Dr. Richards's comments earlier about uh, whether it needs to go to subcommittee. I would, I would really prefer that we receive it back to the Board of Health, um, and it would be helpful to get a better sense of timeline if that's possible. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I believe you're muted. <laughs> I'm, I'm the muted one. Councillor Partridge. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, good discussion all around. Um, I also, similar to the previous speaker, I, I, I think it's really important that we get the overview um, some of the history Dr. Richardson shared with us right now, uh, it's important, but you know what? Uh, our city has changed dramatically over the last 20 years, probably over the last 10 years. It's not just about COVID, but COVID certainly adds to many, many other um, overlapping decisions that need to be made. I, personally, I would think that if we do change to any structure, that it just, it needs to be um, doctors that have, uh, you know, expertise in, in different disciplines that um, that could be part. But again, I prefer everything come back to the Board of Health with some, you know, with some uh, various models that are out there. And then if we decide um, what to do on our next steps, because I think we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. I think then the next steps could be sending it to governance, but I, I'm I'm concerned as well about timing, as the previous speaker said. So I'd like to, I'd like to hear from Dr. Richardson on timing to have that initial report come back to us, please. Thank you, Doctor. Through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you uh, for the question, Councillor Partridge, because indeed report deadlines are already passed for April, and that yep. is what tends to happen. Um, so to do it for May would be uh, more doable, and to get it to you in time to read it before the uh, committee meeting. So if we included uh, Mr. Mayor to the uh, to come back to the Board of Health at the end of May or even early June, um, would that give you uh, and and staff enough time? 
three, Mr. Mayor, to do to, to do as you're uh, suggesting, Councillor, and do that overview report on the structures and that sort of piece, absolutely. Right. But as I said, in terms of looking at pros and cons and further process, I do believe there should be some broader group that looks at that. Yep. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, I mean, we could consider even having a report come back in, in July at the Board of Health in July, but I also think there needs to be the agenda needs to allow for time to really zero in on and have a, a more fulsome discussion on this particular topic. So I wouldn't want to see an agenda crammed with a bunch of other things. Uh, this is this is really super important. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I mean, there's no reason why there can't be two streams on this. In fact, uh, you know, there's no reason why this can't be referred to governance for a look. At, and I think clerks might advise as that's that's the process that we use to determine our procedural bylaw, which I think the Board of Health fits into. Uh, so there's no reason why that can't happen uh, simultaneously. So as as the doctor was bringing back her overview report, uh, governance could be looking at uh, w w what they think conceptually the, it might a change might look like if there were a change desired. So is there any reason that that can't happen? Madam Clerk. I'm just discussing this with Legislative Coordinator Paparella. Okay. Yeah, we what what I think might work best is to bring the report back to Board of Health and then upon that discussion refer to governance. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, I saw your hand come come up. Please go ahead. No, I, I appreciate the uh, uh, what uh, Loren just said. Um, what I, I found so valuable this morning uh, was the expertise, not the brought by the delegates. And the, uh, my concern is shuffling it off to governance. Um, we're, we're just sort of cut off from uh, those who are out in the field practicing um, and who, who bring that uh, particular lens. So I, I would prefer it be kept at the Board of Health, and uh, I would prefer we have an opportunity to engage uh, once again with the members of the community. Thank you. Okay, so let's have a, let's have a formal motion then that, uh, that we request our public health staff to bring an overview report on uh, Board of Health structure uh, historically and, and current uh, to a June Board of Health meeting. Someone want to move that? Councillor Partridge, seconded by Councillor Marula. Thank you. All in favor of that? Votes coming up in just one moment, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. That was Councillors Partridge and Marula. Yes, it was. Thank you very much. And the vote is now open. Thank you. Anyone need to do a manual vote? Councillor Partridge, you're able to vote. Thumbs up. You should you should you should approve it. You did move it. Councillor Vanderbeek. Councillor Farr, thumbs up. Thank you. Councillor Vanderbeek, I don't see at the moment. I see your picture. Okay. And Mr. Mayor, that carries 10 to two. Okay, thank you. And we're going to do, uh, item nine one now, which is the overview of COVID-19 activity in the city of Hamilton uh, from March, 2020 to present. So, doctor, that's a tall order. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. An hour and a half for that one, yeah. Well, and I, I am a little concerned about time because we have this one and we have the the annual service plan and budget to go. Sure. Um, so I'll bring up the, the sit rep for COVID and myself and Stephanie are gonna share this today, but uh, I'm of course doing this on behalf of all sorts of us. And um, I believe you see the presentation now? Yes, we do. Thank you. And so, of course, Michelle, Kevin, Jen, we're all here to, Nid, we're all here to answer questions as we go. Uh, but it doesn't want to change slides. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry. Do you want to take questions as you go or do you want to wait till the end? And I'm going the to end, add. likely. The end. Thank you. 
So again, we'll go through as we usually do an overall update, go through the framework and metrics, and Steph is going to walk you through the epidemiology again, uh, where the response table is at for Hamilton as a whole, and then uh, the fair bit at the end on vaccine. So just overall status, key things to take away from the uh, COVID-19 outbreak itself, the pandemic. Our case activity is increasing in Hamilton um, and we are sitting now at about 100 cases per 100,000 population per week. Um, the percentage of cases that are screened positive for variants is also increasing at about 30% um, as of March the 19th. And uh, Steph will have more details on both of those. We do currently remain in the red. Um, and at this point, you know, there were some changes that the government made to the regulations that we sit under. Um, but as we go through this, um, we'll see some more uh, information about what's happened as we've changed control measures as we go and why we're still sitting in the red. Um, we'll also want to note the rollout of the vaccination program was 64,000 doses having been administered as of Friday and uh, or sorry Thursday was the 18th and um, that we continue to focus on vaccinating the phase one groups and then are beginning to look at what phase two will look like which of course runs through till the end of the summer of 2020. Um, and of course, continuing to follow public health measures remains vital as we go forward, whether we're vaccinated or not. And that is because of both the fact that um, we're still understanding exactly the role of vaccination in preventing transmission, but also we know that vaccination is imperfect. It is very good, um, but it is not 100%. And so as we go forward and raise vaccination rates, it's so important that people continue to follow public health measures. So as I said, we remain in the uh, control area of the provincial response framework, and you'll see as we go through where we stand on a number of metrics. Our weekly incidence rate as of, third, as of Friday sat at 89 per 100,000, and today we sit probably at about 100,000. I haven't seen staffs, although I know she's done it. I just haven't had a chance to see it yet. Uh, take for today on these uh, numbers. Our positive Positivity rate sits at 3.5% as well, which is still in that red zone. Our effective reproduction number is sitting at 1.14. So it's been, it's come up, but it's flatlined the last week. And the percent of community acquired cases is again sitting at about 30%. Well, we have a total of, I think it's 30 active outbreaks as of today. Uh, there tend to be smaller outbreaks and stuff's going to give you more of that as well. Uh, in terms of case follow-up, we're very much uh, on top of it in doing our case uh, follow-up. As you'll see here, we've decided to put in the numbers as well because you can see the growth in the number of cases and what that means in terms of the work that our staff are doing. At the same time, when it comes to contacts, if you'd seen these numbers before the changes to the uh, follow-up measures that happened as the variants came in, you would have seen numbers in the hundreds. And now you're seeing numbers in the thousands, 1,500, uh, almost 2,000 level. And so that is why for us to do all of the close contact tracing is uh, is really not doable, especially when we're looking at school settings and those sorts of things where we're, we are going back to a more streamlined case and contact management approach with notification to people via letter and that sort of thing thing. Um, overall, within our health system, you'll see that our uh, health system remains, you know, with a fair amount of pressure. They are trying to very much balance the uh, the need to be open and continue to do surgery and the sorts of of uh, medical procedures that are needed in order to keep addressing the health concerns of our uh, our population. But at the same time, they are um, having pressures due to COVID, particularly because of some large or some significant outbreaks that are happening within um, HHS at this point in time. Um, their overall critical bed utilization again as well is again up at about 95% for HHS but lower at St. Joe's. They have as well been of course taking on patients from other parts of the province up until recently um, in order to help to share the load from Toronto and Peel and other areas where they're more hard hit. Um, we've been talking a lot about health equity issues and as we look at the uh, issues of mental health and related issues, you'll see here that mental health related emergency visits, emergency department visits are uh, continuing to stay up and um, it is uh, higher than our historical thresholds. Our police response is, is staying sort of flat. Our substance misuse related visits are, are up over our historical thresholds but um, are staying sort of rather stable. 
and then you can see the remainder of the indicators here as well. And at this point, Steph, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Richardson, uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, before I proceed with my usual case summary portion here, I would first just like to remind everyone that these data are accurate as of last Friday morning. Uh, so this graph here displays the number of COVID-19 cases reported to Hamilton Public Health Services per day. Uh, what I've done here is I've divided it up into waves. So you will see a wave three has now been added. Hamilton is now in wave three of COVID-19. Uh, wave one occurred between March and the end of August 2020. Wave two occurred between September 1st, 2020 and February 16th of 2021. And wave three began on February, on February 17th, 2021 and is ongoing. At the peak of wave one in April 2020, approximately 14 cases of COVID-19 were reported to Hamilton Public Health per day. This is in comparison with the peak of wave two in early January 2021, when roughly 137 cases were reported to Hamilton Public Health per day. So this is nearly a tenfold difference. At the very end of wave two on February 16th, 2021, we hit a low of 35 cases reported per day on average to Hamilton Public Health. Uh, case counts did not decrease to a level as low as the end of wave one. After this point, activity began to rise once again. Um, so as of last Friday, the average number of cases reported per day was 76, uh, which was equivalent to activity levels that we experienced in early December 2020. And as Dr. Richardson mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, um, our numbers have continued to rise even further over the weekend. So as of today, um, we're now seeing 88 cases reported per day to Hamilton Public Health, and our weekly incidence rate per 100,000 is now sitting at 102. Uh, Dr. Richardson, if I could ask you to just thank you very much. Um, so this here is a timeline of the control measures that have been implemented in the city of Hamilton, as well as the province of Ontario to control the spread of COVID-19. And this is following the implementation of the provincial reopening framework. In October and November 2020, our case activity in Hamilton was rising steeply. Infections at this time were mainly due to outbreaks and direct contact with known cases of COVID-19. Hamilton first entered the yellow protect zone of the provincial reopening framework on November 7th, 2020, and was then moved to the red control zone shortly after on November 16th. Uh, Hamilton implemented additional public health measures in the city on December 5th, uh, which is referred to as the enhanced red. Case activity continued to climb and the city was then placed into uh, the gray lockdown zone on December 21st of 2020. Um, because COVID-19 activity levels were high in much of Ontario, a provincial lockdown was initiated on December 26th. Uh, implementing the lockdown helped flatten case activity in Hamilton and the second state of emergency declared in Ontario on January 12th of 2021 as well as the stay at home order on January 14th, finally helped to trend our activity levels downwards. After decreasing case counts throughout most of January and early February of 2021, Hamilton was placed back into the red control zone of the provincial reopening framework. Uh, next slide, please, Dr. Richardson. Um, so this slide is a slight change in format from how I have presented the phases of COVID-19 to you in previous Board of Health meetings. Uh, here I have compared the entire pre-peak phase in wave two on the left to our pre-peak phase of wave three thus far on the right. Uh, so you will notice that the pre-peak phase for wave two spanned four months. Uh, this is in comparison to the pre-peak phase of wave three thus far, which spans one month. 
Uh, the, the intention of showing you the data in this manner is to show you the speed at which our cases are already climbing in wave three, and also the differences in activity that we're seeing in wave three thus far. In wave three, in the past month alone, there have already been 1,701 cases reported to Hamilton Public Health. Uh, furthermore, there have already been 59 COVID-19 outbreaks declared and 124 individuals hospitalized. Uh, we were in month three of the pre-peak period of wave two, so in November of 2020, when we reached these, these same case counts. Uh, if these trends continue, our case activity levels for wave three may surpass those reported for wave two. There are some other notice, notable differences between the pre-peak phases of wave two and three. Uh, at the very start of the pre-peak phase of wave two, infections were most commonly due to direct contact with other known cases of COVID-19 and undetermined sources. However, as we got closer to the peak, there was a shift and in infections occurred most frequently because of direct contact and outbreak activity. Uh, this is in comparison to the pre-peak phase of wave three thus far, where infections have most commonly been due to direct contact, but also an equal combination of undetermined sources and outbreak activity. And lastly, another very notable difference is the presence of variants in wave three thus far. Uh, there has been a steady increase in variant cases throughout wave three of COVID-19 in Hamilton. Uh, next slide, please, doctor. Thank you. Um, and as sort of a, a segue from the end of my previous slide, uh, the graph on this slide is showing the increase in COVID-19 variant cases reported in Hamilton. The blue bars represent the total number of cases reported per day, and the orange, lay, orange line overlaid on top represents the percentage of cases that were deemed to be a variant. I have also included a black line just in the middle there to denote when wave two ended and when wave three began. Our first variant case was recorded on January 19th of 2021. And ever since that point, the percentage of reported cases deemed to be a variant has increased consistently, mostly following the start of wave three. Uh, as of last Friday morning, approximately 32% of cases recently reported to Hamilton Public Health are variants. Uh, this translates to greater than 20 variant cases reported on average per day. And in comparison, as of last Friday morning, approximately 43% of cases recently reported in the province of Ontario were deemed to be variants. And furthermore, surrounding health units such as Niagara Region Public Health, Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health, and Halton Region Public Health were in the mid to high 30% range. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So this slide displays the average number of cases by outbreak facility type for both waves two and three. Uh, on the x-axis, you will see the different types of outbreak facilities. And on the y-axis, you'll see the average number of cases per outbreak. Uh, the blue line represents wave two and the orange line represents wave three. Um, as I mentioned before, there have been 59 outbreaks declared by Hamilton Public Health in wave three thus far. The purpose of this graph is to show how, although a high number of outbreaks have been declared in wave three thus far, um, there has been a shift in the magnitude of the outbreaks in several settings um, following the city's vaccine efforts. The average number of cases per long-term care retirement home, hospital, and emergency housing outbreak declared in wave three thus far has been lower than the average number of cases per outbreak in these settings declared in wave two. So for example, there were an average of 14 cases per long-term care retirement home outbreak in wave two. And this is in comparison with just over one case on average per long-term care retirement home outbreak in wave three thus far. And I'll pass it back to you, doctor. Sorry about that, Steph, I switched a little soon. <laughs> but yes, that was a, an important point. 
Um, the uh, COVID-19 response table, which you'll remember is made up of the representatives from the hospitals, primary care, mental health in the community, um, pharmacies, all sorts of, of different health organizations across Hamilton and is co-chaired by a hospital primary care and public health representative. It continues to do a lot of work and that includes the ongoing support that is going on to our uh, communities, businesses and helping them understand the Reopening Ontario Act and the changes that happen with it and how to become in compliant with it and sharing information about the variants of concern, about vaccination and about how to prevent outbreaks. Um, we also continue to work with the assessment centers in adapting the provincial testing direction with the um, the rapid antigen tests that have been coming out and different things that have been um, available to us uh, in those centers as well as elsewhere in our city. Hamilton Paramedics, as you know, has continued to uh, do pop-up testing in various sites in priority neighborhoods in order to improve access to testing and we're continuing to support congregate settings, whether they're long-term care homes, retirement homes, residential care facilities, um, support them in uh, in providing care in those uh, those settings. And we've just struck a new subgroup to support health and community care workers around their mental health and well-being during and beyond the COVID-19 response, because we know this in particular um, is a vulnerable group as well. And, uh, and want to make sure that we're um, working to support them. And we know that those uh, effects could very well be long lasting. So I'm just gonna go uh, back to, I'm going to go on to the COVID-19 vaccine update, but before I do, perhaps I'm gonna, I'll take you just back quickly to the uh, graph that Steph showed. And uh, that's this one. And you can see that the number of cases continue to rise through wave two and that the change to going into red and then into enhanced red, while it may well have slowed down spread and was necessary steps along the way, um, it really wasn't until we went into the province-wide lockdown that we really stopped the increasing numbers in the province. And then in order to turn the corner and bring them down, it did require the stay-at-home order. Um, Right now, what uh, we're sitting in red, of course, it, it would be very similar to what enhanced red was because a lot of what we put in place as part of enhanced red got incorporated into red when they came, brought forward the framework after the provincial state of emergency, um, with the exception of the changes that were made this weekend in terms of uh, restaurants uh, being opened further. Um, so as we look at this and look at the the impacts going forward, um, we do see case numbers rising, as you heard from Steph, across the province. The variants are rising across the province. And in looking at this, and we'll have some further discussions with the province this week, of course, it really required, uh, spec particularly here in Hamilton, where we're, we're in that GTHA with all of the other health units around us, it really did require some concerted efforts beyond our region in order to really turn the curve and bring numbers down. And so we'll continue to have these discussions with the province as we go forward. As well, of course, we now have the vaccine, which I'm just going to speak more about. And you've seen from staff that um, our numbers of uh, people involved in outbreaks in long-term care and retirement homes. So those that are at highest risk of morbidity and mortality, where we've seen our greatest number of deaths, they are now protected. We are also on our way with protecting those who are 80 plus, 75 plus now being able to register. And indeed in our primary care pilots, even all those over 60. And of course it is um, the vulnerability to severe disease and death is very much related to age with a curve um, that matches uh, an exponential sort of curve after the age of 60. And so vaccine as well will help us in bringing down the numbers of cases, but particularly the number of people who are hospitalized due to COVID-19, those that end up in the ICU and those who pass away. So the numbers in those severe categories are anticipated to um, be lower. I'm just gonna come back to the vaccine here. And so we do, as I said, we're continuing to provide vaccine to phase one priority groups. And as of today, we have opened, of course, the first Ontario center. Um, our mobile clinics are continuing for priority populations and for individuals who are over 75 um, across Hamilton. 
just going to give you some idea about the, the magnitude of the number of people we're covering and where we're at in covering those people. So you heard that we've offered six, over 64,000 doses as of the end of day Thursday. Those numbers will, of course, have gone up over the weekend. And we're probably now sitting at more like 10% of our total eligible population. So those that's those um, all those adults who are eligible that are covered by at least one dose in the series and knowing that one dose of vaccine gives significant coverage. There are a number of uh, mobile clinics that continue on. So our, our low risk retirement homes and uh, are continuing to get their wrap up done with second doses ending today. Um, we also have what we call some mop up clinics because the, the number of people in these homes is never static. It's always changing as people are admitted into the homes. And so we go back to make sure that people have access to vaccine as they, uh, the numbers go in. Of course, there's a similar effort for those that are waiting in the hospital to move into long-term care. And so we'll be doing our second doses for alternative level of care, ALC inpatients um, with the second round this week as well. There are uh, four sites this week um, that are going to have uh, pop-up clinics that are happening, and you'll see each of these here. And as well, there's going to be an Indigenous uh, pop-up clinic, which wasn't confirmed with our Indigenous uh, partners until just lately over the weekend. And so that is opening up this weekend as well. And you'll have a note out uh, within an hour or two with all those details in your inboxes. I don't know if I can get the slides to change. So here's our phase one populations. And Kristen has nicely added these little notes at the top so people know what these acronyms mean. Um, so you'll see here the coverage rates down that right-hand column in terms of the proportion that are vaccinated and the size of the populations that are estimated. We don't, of course, in many of these have a a way to gather information. And so we've done a lot of work with long-term care homes, for example, or with our healthcare workers to try and understand the size of that population and then to look at coverage. So you'll see amongst long-term care and retirement home residents, very good levels of coverage, upwards of 100% because of the turnover, but 100% in uh, our long-term care homes and 90% in our residents. Staff coverage is not quite as good at the 68 and 38 mark. And so we, of course, continue to encourage vaccination amongst the staff um, as we go forward. And uh, this uh, continuing to emphasize vaccine confidence will be an important part of our work throughout this uh, this vaccination program. Essential caregivers, um, although they've been eligible from the very beginning, they are at about 13% coverage, we're estimating. But of course, this is a very diff difficult number to get a, an accurate perception of. Um, but it's based on the, the number of people that we received from these long-term care homes and retirement homes in relation to the number of residents that are there. Our healthcare workers, they're divided into various risk categories through a provincial prioritization framework, depending on the kind of work that they do and the exposure risk to COVID-19. Our highest risk healthcare workers are about 75% uh, vaccination rates are estimated by the end of the day today. The very high overall, um, both the community-based and the hospital-based are sitting probably about 64% um, in terms of that group by end of day today. Our ALC patients were sitting at about 25% vaccinated, so we'll see if those can come up as we go back into that group. Our seniors at 85 and over were sitting at about 77% vaccinated so far, and 49% already of those 80 to 84 estimated by end of day today based on the clinic volumes and the appointments that were open to them. We'll see if the uptake rate was as good as, um, as the amount of, of uh, appointments that were available. You'll remember we did a blitz with shelter residents and staff. The uptake there was about 30%. Um, and so that was a population we did to ensure stability in, in, uh, in the shelter system. And particularly, the, the, uh, it didn't to spill over into healthcare systems as they're, they've been dealing with increasing case numbers. But again, the uptake rate could be uh, even better. Yeah, amongst our urban Indigenous adults, you'll uh, recall consistent with the principles of OCAP or ownership control, access and possession. It is not we who decide about the release of Indigenous uh, data. It is our Indigenous community who makes those decisions. And so we're continuing to work with them to understand what they would like to do in that regard. Um, adult chronic home care patients, this is a group where um, we have to get lists and get them into the system and we've been working very closely with our Lynn colleagues in order to do that and um, we are sitting right now at about 5% 
vaccination coverage we're estimating by the end of today. These other groups we're just working on now, so seniors in other congregate settings that aren't formal retirement homes or long-term care facilities, we estimate there's about 500 in those sorts of facilities that are going to be, um, we're working with them around mobile clinics uh, over the next couple of weeks. And then those healthcare workers that are at high risk and moderate risk, they will uh, now be eligible to sign up for an appointment as we uh, convert over them over into the provincial portal as well. Um, in phase two, this is where a huge number of our community will be vaccinated. Um, vaccinating according to age is still a very important principle as we go uh, into phase two. And so you'll see the province has brought in the 75 to 79 already at this point. That's about 19,000 people here in Hamilton who can now register for the vaccine. And then you can see the size of the age groups in this phase are, are fairly significant with almost another 100,000 people beyond that group to go forward. Of course, our 60 to 64 began being vaccinated through some primary care clinics as of March 13th, and those primary care clinics can now vaccinate anybody who's over 60 with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And these are the other groups as we move forward into phase two, the staff and residents of other high-risk congregate settings like community living centers and those sorts of things, um, those with high-risk um, health conditions, and particularly those at the highest risk are ones that we'll be looking at uh, moving forward sooner as we uh, have vaccine available. And then communities uh, that are greater risk, and you'll know that we've done some of those already to date in our uh, clinics that we have done with our CHC partners, already um, and the ones that we're also of course doing with our indigenous population. And then this other group, the essential service workers, the frontline workers who cannot work from home are in this group as well. And over a six month period. Um, right now, as we're moving into the, um, the remainder of the populations around um, the healthcare workers, the uh, the age-based group down to 75. We're actually seeing now we have more than enough supply for the number of uh, of people who are coming forward to register. So we are help hopeful that people will come out to register in, in large numbers. It's not the vaccine right now that's the rate lim limiting factor for us. Rather, we need to make sure we're open enough and accessible enough so that uh, people can come forward and register and then see how quickly we can begin to move through these additional populations. So they'll be, the province has indicated, you know, they'll want to really look at where we're at and how we can uh, move forward over the coming uh, couple of weeks uh, into this, uh, this next group. And we do anticipate that there'll be further specific guidance in that regard. So just a reminder, this is our overall uh, placement for the Hamilton COVID-19 vaccination plan, just to give you a sense of context as we go forward with all the different modalities that we're looking at as we go forward and which ones work best. And with that, I'll end there and see if there's any questions. I'm gonna take this down, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you very much, Stephanie and Doctor. And I have Councillors Partridge and Councillors Jackson for questions, so Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, thank you for the overview. There a lot of good information there. Um, it, on, on the one slide, you talked about primary care currently doing 60 to 69 year olds. What's the definition of primary care? Is that when they're in a home or is that a clinic? So primary care are, are it, we often call them family medicine. So these are our family doctors, our nurse-led uh, primary care clinics. There are community health centers. So they're basically where we go for our day-to-day -day healthcare needs. Um, and so there was a pilot that was run in primary care across the province that is going on right now. We are one of the centers who is doing that pilot. And we have 12 organizations running uh, 10 clinics um, within their, their population. So they are calling up people who qualify for the vaccine, who are part of their patient group. And uh, that includes the three CHCs, as well as a number of uh, larger primary care practices. So this was part of a provincial pilot to see how best to move um, vaccine into primary care and they are using the AstraZeneca vaccine. Initially, it was only approved for those 60 to 64. And then now that it, uh, it's been approved for a larger age group, it's anybody over 60. And so they're working that through. 
So, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I appreciate that explanation, but I mean, what I'm hearing repeatedly, and by the way, today we are absolutely getting flooded with phone calls. Um, that that So where are these primary care in Hamilton and is there one in Flamborough? So how, how do people access this? So through you, Mr. Mayor, as we've um, communicated in the updates, um, there's some information there. These are ones where primary care, this is trialing a model for primary care where people uh, are called by their primary care provider, nurse, their physician, their office to bring them in and ask them to come in for vaccination. So these are not sites that people can sign up for. They are sites where people are called out by their primary care physician, nurse, office staff to be invited to come in for vaccination. So, Michelle, in terms of location, I've forgotten where each of them are. Do you remember? I threw you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, Dr. Richardson, I don't have that information off the top of my head either, but Councillor, I'm happy to follow up with you. Yeah, no, and, and I appreciate that. It, it, so, I, I, but, you know, again, I'm, I'm just trying to get a, a clear explanation for my community. So, they can actually access wherever these primary care locations are in the city. Um, I'd like to know where they are. I, I'm assuming it's not a secret. And and is it that they're going to be those who are most at risk within that age group that will get a call um, from their physicians? Because even, even at that, the 80 to 85 and 85 and over, there's, you know, I'm hearing, and others are across the city, there's there's a number that have not been called by their physician or by the hospital when they were supposed to be. And and they're, they're you know, people are scared. Like they really, they don't want to be missed and fall through the cracks. So Mr. Mayor, I'm just trying to get as much of an explanation for people as I can. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So for the 60 to 60, the 60 plus now pilot, these primary care locations were chosen in parts of the city uh, by our primary care partners who made those choices um, to be in the traditional code red neighborhoods as much as possible um, in order to facilitate access for those who are um, at greatest risk, where there have been the greatest number of infections, who had the uh, higher levels of morbidity and mortality. So that is where they were cited um, when primary care was looking at where to hold those clinics. Um, in terms of who they call out from them, the change in the age group just happened at the end of last week. So they're just looking at how to do that, but they are looking at the people rostered in their, um, on their lists to call them in. So they've been doing that for over a week now uh, with those that were 60 to 64. And then we'll have to look with the supply they have available. There's a limited supply that was allocated to these uh, pilot sites and look at how they go forward with it. So that's a better explanation, just identifying that they're really in the code red districts. Um, I, I think, you know, it's it's easier for, uh, certainly for myself as a counselor to get my head around, you know, absolutely it is for those at risk, they should be the ones getting it first, uh, but that's kind of a, a better explanation. Uh, so thank you. I did have a call last week, Mr. Mayor, um, from public health staff and we spoke about Harry Howell um, and, and the importance of having Harry Howell opened up. And the staff person had called me and said, where would be the good location We, you know, within Ward 15 in Flamborough that would get to the rural people as well as getting to the, the urban people uh, within, within Waterdown. And so Harry Howell was identified at, within that conversation, as I say, a week ago, to be a, a good site. The reason I raised this, Mr. Mayor, is I had a number of phone calls um, from folks 85 and older who wanted to know when it was going to be open and why it was closed, because it was open for a certain a couple of days. Um, they don't want to go into Hamilton to get there. Some of them are not capable, uh, mobility-wise, of, of being able to get downtown and get parked and et cetera, et cetera. So my question through you, sir, is, when will Harry Howell uh, be be up and running, and and has it been identified as an important location for Flamborough folks? Thank you. I see Michelle just pop on there, and yeah, yes, it has been identified uh, quite some time ago, actually. Michelle, go ahead. But it's not open, and that's not, what my residents yet. are no. asking. Thank when you, is Michelle. that going to happen? And then again, 
you know, they're, this is for the 80, 85 year olds and 90 year olds. Uh, they want their vaccine. They're scared and they don't know where to go. They want to go to Harry Hell. They want to stay within their within I, I, their ward. I, th I think our staff have have provided you know, plenty of information as to where they can go right now. So Michelle, why don't you refresh our memory? Yep, so through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you. So we will be back to Harry, Harry Howell. That is the Waterdown Flamborough site that we're using. So next week we are going to have our mobile clinics. I guess I would step back and say the mobile clinics were never intended to stay in one place. They are uh, intended to be mobile pop-up. They go to an area for a period of time, sometimes just a day, sometimes three, four days or a week and then they move along and yes, they will come back to the same location. So next week uh, we are in at the Stony Creek Recreation Center. We're at Bernie Morelli, uh, Norman Pinky Lewis Recreation Center and Ryerson Recreation Center. So that's for next week. The following week, we're gonna be back to those rural clinics that we started out with. So you'll see us again in Glanbrook at Harry Howell for Dundas Flamborough. We would be at the Dundas Lions, the Ancastry Rotary and in Winona, Winona at Salt Fleet. And so they'll be at those sites again for another week. Um, and again, for eligible uh, residents at that point in time, once we're there for another week, or it could be a couple extra days for some of the sites, depending on registration uptake, we would move on again to additional sites. So really we have a limited number of mobile clinics. Mm -hmm. They're a little more complicated to offer than our large scale clinics. They're small in size, which is great for some folks to move through them. They're a little more manageable, but at the same time, it does limit the numbers we have. Right now to book into a mobile clinic, the provincial booking tool doesn't allow that to happen. There's some logistical right. problems with it. Yeah, so um, anyone that's interested can book into the clinics this week and into next week through our phone line, but we're actively working on standing up a second virtual tool that will allow online booking into mobile as well. Uh, Councillor, I think you'll see that well in place before we're back to Harry Howell, so we'll have some other opportunities for booking. So, sure. Michelle, thank you very much for that explanation. And Mr. Mayor, I really I appreciate that. But what I am hearing is that there will not be vaccines for my 80 and 90 year olds in Flamborough and in Waterdown until the end of April, possibly going into May. We're already in the last week of March. Um, I'm hearing Harry Howell isn't on the uh, schedule until mid to end of April from, from what you rolled out. And there is no way for them to book at this point into any of those mobile units. So what do they do? Do they just sit tight? And, and how are we going to communicate out to people in my community? And, and really, this is for across Flamborough. You know, it, it pertains to uh, Councillor Vanderbeek's area as well. Um, when and how do they book? What do we say to them? Because we're getting the calls and, and some of them are pretty upset. Michelle? So through, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, very good questions. And certainly we, we do want to be accessible to everyone. So right now, uh, they would need to come into Hamilton so they can come to First Ontario Place uh, or to St. Joe's on the mountain. We are at Harry Howell again in two weeks' time. So it's just the week after next that we're back with mobile again at Harry Howell and uh, be there for that week for sure. And then we'll return again after that. And but so how did they book, Michelle? Sorry, oh, I, I just so, they, sorry. The, the burning so, question I'm getting from everybody is, how do I book into these mobile units? I want to go to Harry Howell. How do I get there? So right now, to book into a mobile unit, you need to do that by telephone. So it's the COVID hotline. It's 905-974-9848, and they select option seven. And you can just select option seven right away. We are currently working to onboard a second online booking tool that will be amenable to booking mobile sites because we're hearing from constituents, of course, across the city that phone line, uh, you know, isn't for everybody and the online booking tool works quite well. The provincial tool doesn't work for mobile, so we are trying to bring on another option that is uh, manageable for these small clinics. So looking at having that happen this week. Um, the other piece I would add, I guess, Councillor, in keeping with the primary care pilot, 
We're also looking at opportunities to pilot within pharmacy and again, using those pharmacy locations um, that we piloted and we're not, we're not there yet, but using them to complement the sites we already have, again, to address some of these accessible options for folks that can't get downtown. I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor and Michelle, and, and perhaps looking at piloting uh, in the pharmacies in the outlying areas would be a better way for the city and public health to serve our residents who are living out there, because right now we're not. We're not, we're not telling them how to. Um, to get a 90-year-old, an 80-year-old, and in some cases even a 70-year-old to get on the phone and pick options and hold, and it, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's not going to happen. So I appreciate as quickly as we can to get this information out there, and that to me seems to be the biggest issue: is how we're not communicating uh, in a way that the residents are happy with. That's not me. That's what I'm hearing from my residents. They do not understand how to work this system to get their vaccination. So I'll leave you with that. But, you know, I still, I don't think the answers that we've got right now are, are satisfactory. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Dr. Richardson, to you and your outstanding team once again. Great work. I have a series, Mr. Mayor, of quick questions that hopefully just require either an elaboration or clarification from uh, Dr. Richardson, please. Uh, just quickly, Dr. Rich Richardson, to the uh, important voices we heard earlier today through the delegations, you've uh, referenced Indigenous, marginalized, racialized uh, groups. Are you networking to those groups to and to the individuals uh, in those areas of our city to ensure uh, that uh, in light of their special needs, uh, they are being addressed. Through you, Mr. Mayor, please. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. I'm gonna actually ask Jen Vickers Manson, who's been heading up the committee and working with a, a, a steering committee group. Jen, are you there? I always yeah. like hearing from Director Vickers Manson. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson, for the question and through the mayor to you. Uh, we have um, started a table called the Vaccine Readiness Network, and there are several individuals on it. It's not an exclusive table that either represent uh, the voices of our racialized community and or organizations or specialists or individuals that service them. And we've been meeting with them since the end of 2020 with the aim of understanding uh, some of their needs as it pertains to information uh, being presented in a culturally sensitive uh, in relevant way to answer questions specific to their concerns and lived experience in order to make an informed choice uh, so to decide whether or not to receive COVID-19. And in addition to that, we've been doing some outreach related to what are some of the barriers to attending a vaccine clinic. Uh, and that's been uh, shared with our operational team to help select where our mobile clinics are going um, and as well has informed the development of the ambassador um, hiring process that we've put in place and was discussed about uh, by some of the delegates today. Thank you, Director. Wonderful news, and I think that was important for uh, public consumption. Dr. Richardson, just a few uh, elaborations or clarifications in light of all the data you presented uh, today, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, so if I heard correctly, uh, COVID cases in all our LTCs are way down versus months ago, but it's within the community concern that some numbers are rising. Through you, Mr. Mayor, is that correct, Doctor? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, our numbers in terms of long-term care and retirement homes, those uh, larger outbreaks, they're not, we're not seeing those now as we go forward. And that I'm sure has a lot to do with the vaccination coverage that is there, as well as the, the due diligence of the, the staff who are there and following infection prevention and control measures as we go forward. So while you do occasionally still see a case uh, related to them, or perhaps a few, because the vaccination coverage isn't perfect, um, it is a much better situation that was there. But our case numbers overall continue to rise, yes across the community. Uh, uh, supplementary, Dr. Richardson, um, we're in red. All the neighboring municipalities around the GTA to Niagara, we're all similarly in red, correct, Mr. Mayor, through you to Dr. Richardson? Through you, Mr. Mayor, no, not quite. Um, are, you, you'll recall that Peel and Toronto continue to be in gray, although it's a different gray um, after this weekend than it was before in terms of some additional pieces being opened up. And so there is sort of a, a movement of gray towards red and, and a little bit of red 
away from where it was, but there, um, the differences between them, there are some for selected things such as uh, fitness centers and uh, for uh, personal service settings. And uh, there is no indoor dining allowed in gray, but otherwise they're fairly sim similar. So let me bring it closer to home. Uh, the immediate bordering municipalities of Niagara region and Halton region, are they similar to us, Dr. Richardson in red? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I knew I should have pulled these up, but last night I could not get it to work on uh, on the internet and I haven't tried again this morning. Uh, Halton for sure is in red. I believe Niagara is in red. I'm not sure what Wellington is on our north side, if that's orange or red at this point. And then as you go towards the east, it becomes more and more gray. Okay, thank you, Dr. Richardson. I, I, Mr. Mayor, I'm saying that, I'm not gonna get into why I'm saying that, but I'm just hoping, I know Dr. Richardson has to do what she's done outstandingly for the last 12 months in a professional manner medically for the health of our community. But I just, with the numbers increasing, I just hope in light of the Ford government, Mr. Mayor, opening up for more restaurants to have greater capacity of patrons. I'm just hoping with neighboring municipalities abutting us, all in red like us, we keep that in mind as well, as well moving forward. Last two questions. I've I've had a number of pharmacies in my ward, Dr. Richardson, asking, uh, can they now be open and provide the uh, vaccinations? What's the status of that, Mr. Mayor? Through you, please. Through you, Mr. Mayor. The, so the pharmacies as a vaccination channel has been worked very much at a provincial level in terms of them working with different pharmacies. And so we give some advice on where, um, you know, would be good pharmacies to locate as they slowly open up the number of pharmacies across the province. You'll recall that initially they were opened up in other areas, not here. They were done in Kingston and yeah. Toronto, Windsor, for example. Um, and But they're looking over the next couple of weeks as the AstraZeneca supply continues to increase, they're looking to increase the number of pharmacies. So currently there's about 350 pharmacies in those uh, identified areas and they're looking to bring it up to 700 and it may well be um, that they, they look towards areas that have a higher level of, of disease activity um, in terms of, of where those further pharmacies are. So we're still waiting to hear. We're certainly in dialogue. Michelle has been talking to local pharmacies. She also has a pharmacy table that she uh, works with and uh, talked with some local pharmacies about, you know, how could they move forward, but it's very much a dialogue that's mainly happening at the provincial level. So just quickly, Mr. Mayor, supplementary to that, Dr. Richardson, it's not like you need a resolution from us or you're kind of waving your hand to the Ford government saying, hey, don't forget Hamilton. We got a, a whole bunch of wonderful pharmacies here. You're saying it's on their radar. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, Mr. Mayor, it's definitely on their radar. They are trying to, uh, it's on the province's radar. They are trying to get as much vaccine out as it comes in and through all the channels that can possibly do it. Last question, a uh, number of dentists and optometrists that I know recently were asking me, uh, they're uh, hopefully part of the Hamilton Healthcare Workers uh, system that should be hopefully uh, priorities for vaccinations. Uh, do they just simply access our website to get registered on the list or is there some special way that uh, professionals like de dentists and optometrists can get registered? And that's my last question, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So we've had the healthcare worker portal open since February 24th, and the province published a very detailed prioritization guidance. But anybody, such as an ophthalmologist, optometrist, dentist, they would all qualify as healthcare workers and can register via that route. Um, and uh, as you saw in the vaccination coverage, we've been working our way through um, providing vaccine to those groups and doing pretty well. Thank you, Dr. Richardson, for all your answers. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Quick question for me, Dr. Richardson, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I think it was slide 15 or 16, just so I, I understand clearly. You were referencing seniors in other congregate settings when you were giving out the, um, the, the vaccine numbers. Can you give me an example of, of what that might be? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, and if uh, we go into much further details, I might turn to Jen or Michelle, but essentially these are, are um, uh, congregate settings where there's shared dining and those sorts of facilities, but they aren't formal retirement homes and long-term care facilities. So they're not seniors' apartment buildings where seniors um, happen to live, but rather they are a congregate setting where there is some sort of bringing together of people um, uh, and that they need to come together for per specific purposes. So Michelle, do you want to add to that at all? Sure, through you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, Councillor, I would suggest that there are only a few of these facilities. The majority, of course, are 
uh, retirement homes, but these are homes where they may not meet the definition of a retirement home because they're not a care service provider. So they have shared dining facilities, but they don't have the care component that would make them a retirement home. There's also just a couple actually that for the most part cater to seniors, but the care level is actually beyond that which we might expect to see in a retirement home uh, type setting, but it's not a long-term care home. If you think of individuals perhaps with acquired um, brain injury or perhaps other uh, behavioral issues, so they might be in this type of setting, but they're very low in numbers within Hamilton congregate settings for seniors outside of the group, of course, of retirement homes. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, again, thank you very much, Dr. Richardson, for your leadership and to all your staff members. I know you've been all working at an exhaustive pace, and I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Vanderbeek. Uh, sorry, I couldn't get my cursor to come up above the mute button. Curse the cursor. Um, well, thank you. Um, just a couple of questions, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'd like to go back to the conversation uh, that Councillor Partridge had about Harry Howell. Uh, I think that, that we, need, we need to look at how we're communicating information out to the residents where these pop-up mobile units are going to be present. Um, I, I have a serious concern that we know that, that the, I now know that the Dundas and the Harry Howell, both of which pertain to my ward, because it spans both, um, will be there the week after next, but, but where is the communication to tell people that they can now book to get into those units? So not only that they can now book, because I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the bookings don't open up until the week before uh, the, 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 the scheduling is available. And so they should be opening up, I don't know, the next Monday maybe for the week, the next week for, for the Dundas and Harry Howell and various other pop-ups that are gonna be open in two weeks time. And how are we getting that message out to people that now they can book However, they can't book online, they must phone. And so then the question is, if they're, if they're all phoning, is the, is the phone line going to be able to handle that? Because there are people who could book online or are still phoning because they have questions or they're not sure or they're not comfortable or they don't have internet. So how, uh, how, are, we, how are we doing that? And, Thank you. and I, I, do understand, yeah. I do understand that they're, that they're periodic but people don't understand that either. They don't, they're not aware of that. So can someone help me with that, please? Michelle? Up through you, Mr. Mayor. So, so yes, they are periodic. And I agree with you that I think there was some confusion about that, that uh, thinking that once we come to a site, we stay there. And, and in fact, that's not the case. They are truly pop up. They come in that area and they leave. With respect to the um, rural sites, so that would be Harrell, Harry Howell and Dundas, they actually start next week. This week is the downtown sites that I went through. On the weekend, we have the Indigenous clinics and then we have Harry Howell beginning again. There will be um, media going out this week, actually very soon with respect to how you book into those sites. Back to Councillor Partridge's comments, we'd really hoped that we would be able to use the provincial booking tool and that's what we wanted to do with the mobile clinics. Unfortunately, the logistics of how that tool works doesn't work for those settings in the way that we thought that it would. So we're going to try to have an online platform available, but right now phone is the option. At this point in time, the phone line is able to accommodate the volume of calls coming in and has been for the last week or so. The wait time is very, uh, very low. And when I say very low, under a couple of minutes. So it doesn't take a lot of time, but hear you completely that, you know, online can be much more efficient for lots of folks and people can do it on their own schedule. So we're certainly working toward that. Oh, Dr. Elizabeth, Dr. go Elizabeth. ahead. I was just going to add to that, and as as we get to a point now that we understand that the provincial piece isn't going to work for us, and we will have these scheduled out as we go, and we can look at a longer range sort of 
getting the information out. So absolutely appreciate the frustrations in terms of doing it. We share most, almost every one of those frustrations with you. And I know Al's team does it, man's the hotline as well. Um, but now that we understand it, we're going to get this other method off the ground as soon as we can, but uh, look for it to improve over the next week or so. Thank you. And so, so I guess that does not, that does not help though with the uh, the question of how do we how can we tell people when these clinics are coming is it possible to have firm dates going forward so that we can make sure people understand that for the clinic on this date you must book starting this day and so the line will be free and they will be able to book generally they could book right now for dundas but no one knows it's coming that's my that's my problem michelle and through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, uh, Councillor, that's exactly what we're working toward and to the piece about planning out further in advance. Now that we know how these clinics operate and the limitations on our systems, we can give a schedule well out into the future so we'll know when they're coming and when they're leaving. And so you'll have a good sense yourself so you can share with your own um, ward constituents with respect to the comings and goings of those clinics. Thank you. That would be extremely beneficial. I have, I hope I have a little more time left. I have two more questions. I think they're quick. What about, um, what about people who can't wear a mask when they go to the clinics? What happens? Doctor? You're on mute, Michelle? Michelle. Did you punt it? Okay, Michelle. Thanks to you, Mr. Mayor. So it is the expectation right now that everybody wear a mask if they're able to do so. And so when folks come into a clinic, if they don't have a mask, they're certainly offered one. If they have no capacity to wear a mask for whatever medical reason themselves, our staff still have a mask on, so everyone else in the clinic is masked. So they will be allowed in with no mask then? Mm -hmm. Will That's they not be required to, to wear a face clinic. shield or anything? If they have the capacity to wear a face shield, they can be provided a face shield on site. Okay, well, I was more thinking of people who were there with their mask on and seeing someone with absolutely nothing. Um, thank you for that. And so through you, Mr. Mayor, my last question. Um, uh, every night I'm writing. Oh, in home. So is there any consideration um, for I just don't know how to answer um, residents who ask me about this for in-home vaccination. Michelle? Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. So that planning is underway right now, Councillor, uh, working with paramedics on how we can visit those folks who aren't able to leave their home that are now eligible for vaccine because they receive in-home care for a chronic condition. And we're looking at how we do that on a mobile basis. So it would be in partnership with paramedics. So could I just make, just out of your answer, what is in-home care for a chronic condition? Is it, so if I get a PSW every week or it, what is it? So it very much could be that. It depends on the condition they have. So right now it's anyone who's um, receives, they're receiving home care, so yes. To that and we're working again with our Lynn um, partners with respect to who is that eligible list of individuals who receive care within their home okay thank you those are my questions yeah. thank you thank very you. much yeah. dr richardson um, and michelle and thank you mr mayor i appreciate you. the opportunity okay councillor pearson thank you mr mayor and certainly a number of questions that i had have been asked and answered, um, but I think one of the most important, I just want to ask through Dr. Richardson, whoever, the rollout of the vaccine, how are we doing on the supply? Because everything that's been asked here today is all contingent on supply. So how is that going? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So supply um, continues to come, it's steady. And um, we did end up getting a little extra supply last week, which is when our lowest uh, week of supply was. This week is better. Right now, it is essentially the booking process um, in this short period of time in terms of the people who are eligible uh, vis -vis the amount of vaccine we have. It's really our booking press process that's slowing us down. Um, in terms of getting vaccine out, our clinics right now aren't absolutely full, which is what we would want to see. Um, and then as we go forward through these weeks, um, we'll continue to see as, as groups become eligible. I think we'll see, you know, us having 
you know, a better match between supply and booking. And then, uh, you know, we'll go into the next group as we go forward. So it's still going to take us through, you know, into the summertime in terms of getting this vaccine completely rolled out. But um, right now, supply is keeping up with the number of people who are asking for it within the eligible groups. Thank you for that. So we're we're um, administering everything that comes in right now. We're not holding on to anything, we're, uh, except maybe the residents. But we don't even have to worry about the ones who've received the first dose. It's now up to 16 weeks, so we don't have to re worry about that time period for the second dose, correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's right. We're not holding back anything we got right down to just a couple hundred doses in the fridge uh, at the beginning of last week um, this week as I said it's really been more an issue of getting as many people booked into the clinic spots that we have so we do have a little left um, that's in the fridge that is very much um, what we would like to get into people's arms this week Perfect. Appreciate that. And it was mentioned about pharmacies, and I know I heard the premier mention last night on the news as well that they're they're initiating to get the rollout to the pharmacies as well. And so my question, because I don't think the general public realize, when the rollout happens to the pharmacies and and hopefully to the doctors' offices, who oversees that, Dr. Richardson? Through you, Mr. Mayor, it's different actually for those two groups. So for the pharmacies, they're negotiating directly with the province around that rollout. The, the province does ask us for some advice in terms of where to roll them out, where is the, the first places to get going, for example, back to looking at those communities that have been hardest hit. Um, but ultimately, they have the pharmacies have negotiated with the province and very much like they do for flu vaccine, um, that has been rolled out separately through that route. When it comes to primary care, that is a pilot that is running right now with the province uh, between our primary care group and the province. But as we go forward, um, that's very much something that we do together. We do supply them with their vaccine. We uh, do all of those sorts of elements of it. Um, the, the actual process to book them in is up to their primary care offices right now. Uh, because you can only imagine the complexity of having a whole lot of providers on a site and what that might mean. But um, it is uh, it is uh, something we work with our primary care docs on. And I should just say as well that we have lots of our primary care providers, doctors, nurses, staff that are working in our mass vaccination or our large scale clinics that are that are going on every day, whether it's at HHS, St. Joe's or now at uh, First Ontario Centre. So they're they're working across every uh, part of the vaccination program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I think it's important for the general public to understand it's more than just doing what we've been doing so far, what you guys have been doing so far. There's a whole more complex um, avenue behind that you're working on and, and, and making sure it moves forward safely and, and quickly. Um, can you, you mentioned, Dr. Richardson, can you mention um, possibly how many staff are we up to now on the phone lines and the vaccination? Sorry about that. And, the, and, and vaccinating. Do we have a numbers as far as staff? Michelle, do you want to address that one? Sure. So from a vaccination perspective, if we look at First Ontario in particular right now, we have um, at any time 100, just over 100 staff on site there. It's a mix of clinical and non-clinical from the public health side of things. We are providing, for the most part, the clinical staffing is there as well as um, some of the management group. The non-clinical staff, of course, coming from the city as a whole, it's a mix of deployed staff and new hires. Uh, then the um, other clinical staff there are coming from our partners, so from primary care providers. And of course, I shouldn't overlook Hamilton paramedics are there with us as well. Uh, the clinical sites across the board, we do have non-clinical staff from public health at the other clinics as well, but our injectors remain just at First Ontario and at our mobile clinics. With respect to the hotline at this point in time, we have just over 25 people that are answering calls and continue to manage that line. Uh, in vaccine as a whole, we have over 300 people right now that are city employees that are working on this initiative. So significant numbers, uh, lots of work underway and wonderful commitment, great employees. 
Thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Richardson, Michelle. I appreciate that. Um, and it, it is good information public to know because I've been trying to keep, um, you know, the emails and the information that's come across our desks on where we're at with everything. And there's a lot of staff involved and certainly we'll, we'll ramp up more as we need it and certainly appreciate the, um, the uh, staff uh, members from other areas of the city library board that I'm a member of that has been seconded and, and are assisting as well. So kudos to them and to everyone Everyone that you've been able to get on board. Um, lastly, and it's not and it's not, not a derogatory negative, but I, I do have some concerns, and I just want to have clarification, please. In mentioning the pop-ups for for Salt Fleet, do not use Winona with it, please, please, please. It's become very confusing. So I have a Winona Senior Center, I have a Fruitland, I have a Fruitland Community Center. So believe me, and they're all within the same area. It gets very confusing. Please refer to it as the Salt Fleet Community Center on Highway Number 8. I just want to put that forward because you can't believe the phone calls that I get. People going, well, I was on Sherwood Park Drive. I was on Winter. Well, okay, they're not there. So just making sure we create as a little confusion as possible. And thank you, everyone, for the tremendous amount of work you're doing. Believe me, the emails that I'm getting from residents that have not been happy with how we've rolled out, I, I stand behind our staff. 200% that you guys have done a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous job. And I want to thank you. Take care. Lots of nodding of heads, especially on the last part. Thank you, Councillor Farr. I actually scripted my accolades, Mr. Mayor. That's how important <laughs> it is this time around. Anyway, to quote Ford, who quoted the general in your presence at uh, FOC last week, late last week in Hamilton, quote, Hamilton's knocking it out of the park, yeah. end quote. And then to quote Ford himself, quote, absolutely amazing, end quote. So I just simply want to say through you um, and, and to uh, Dr. Richardson, would your advice then for any counselor seeking timelines, any announcements respecting any aspects of COVID-19 vaccinations? Because it is important that we all communicate. I'm finding uh, residents find it extremely valid and uh, comforting to engage with me when I share your information. And that that's probably uh, the case, obviously, throughout the city. So would your advice simply be a simple question to counsel Keep an eye on our, our daily comms that you're sending to us, even the comms that you send to tell us that you're sending comms. And um, also, we all still have that EOC lead council liaison that we can take advantage of too to answer any questions. So would that be uh, a, a good critical advice at this time for anyone who you know wants to make sure that they're on top of things through you, Mr. Mayor? Through you, Mr. Mayor, there's, there are those many routes, and thank you, Councillor Farr. There are the media briefings, which the Mayor, myself, and Paul does each Monday, and so vaccines always discussed there, and you could, of course, get summaries of those that come out afterwards. Um, there are the comms and the comms before the comms that come uh, to you each time that we do any sort of media release or update, and in fact, one of those should be landing in your inbox right now about the the clinics at Salt Fleet and the other sites that are happening this week. Um, as well, you get a regular vaccine update every Friday afternoon, uh, giving a summary of what has happened and what's going to happen to the extent we know it for the upcoming week. So all of those are great places. And of course, there's also our Twitter feed, our uh, social media, which our colleagues uh, put out and our website as well that are there um, for your help and assistance. And we very much appreciate absolutely the role that you're all playing in being ambassadors for the program and for the vaccine. Well, I, I think it goes without saying we've got awesome staff from health all the way through all those other departments, Mr. Mayor, people who are who are, are stepping out of their normal roles and making us, uh, you know, a focal point in Ontario. When you have General Hillier um, making the comment that he made late last week through our premier, who is also equally impressed, it, it tells me that with this issue and and the fluidity that is 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 part of this issue that's that's such a a key part of this issue that whole knocking out of the park and, and amazing um uh, absolutely amazing uh comment is about how well we're handling the fluidity because just by the questions and the comments that we're hearing today even the updates everything changes so rapidly and now that we're in the vaccination stage i think 
everyone's paying close attention because they're going to wait for their turn. It's really important stuff for all ages. So I'll just say finally, Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, on the parking uh, uh, at COPS, I know there was some Flamborough people there this morning that uh, meet the age criteria, and uh, they are going to, for now, be coming from all over the city. We can get up to 3,000 vaccinations a day, as you know. The drop-off, and this is easy stuff, uh, way easier than trying to get into a, a, a Honey Badgers game. Uh, all of the parking on the facade sides York and uh, Bay drop off pick up pick up for residents across the city uh, no need to worry about uh, uh, enforcement uh, it's a non-enforcement area and then of course we offer the two hours of validated parking at the parkade oh real quick Mr. Mayor I think just judging from the tour that we took um, Friday what is it a half hour experience I know you got to sit after the injection what would you say in the door out the door and I'm sorry if I missed it half hour 40 minutes to Dr. Richardson, or, or, or I can Michelle answer Burke. that. Forty, forty-five minutes is 45. what I hear. Okay. But uh, Doctor, please. <laughs> I'm just looking to Michelle as well. It would be about that. Yeah. But okay. Minutes. So, and you get the two-hour validated at York, which is spit and distance. So, thanks again for everything. I really appreciate. It. I've been very, very impressed as of late, um, and uh, I appreciate the time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Pauls. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Richardson, for this wholesome conversation we're having about uh, vaccines and everything. But as we're talking, I've had two emails, uh, and I was wondering if you could help me out with this question. The Hamilton Spectator article indicated that today, Monday, those 75 and over are eligible to re register for the a uh, COVID vaccine using online provincial portal. I have gone to the online provincial portal this morning and discovered that it has not been updated to include in their eligible category, those 75 uh, age and over. This is very disappointing. Can you please advise why there is contradiction between the Hamilton Spectator reporting and the Ontario website? Very specific question, well phrased, doctor. I'm going to turn to Michelle, please, Mr. Rear. My, By the way, my in-laws, who are 75 and older, uh, registered on the provincial uh, site this morning. Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to the councillor, the website, the provincial website might be worded like that. I haven't looked at it myself this morning, but I do know that the eligibility is open. So if you do have constituents of that age group, despite what the provincial portal might say the eligibility is, once the health card number is in, those 75 and older will be able to book. So I'm not sure uh, why the website looks like that today, but I do know that it's open to the eligibility as stated. So you can just let people go ahead, tell them to go ahead if they are eligible. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And just a... Um, um, Last comment for me. I mean, this has been a such a dynamic, fluid process. Uh, there's there's seemingly changes, you know, minute to minute, day by day. Whether and most most of them are coming from the province. We're we're the administrators of whatever they deem to be the process in which uh, we are to administer the vaccine. So, no surprise in terms of this complexity. Uh, I think uh, we ought to give our good staff some latitude and, and you know, an understanding and appreciating that. Uh, that kind of change uh, so often so quickly uh, leads to confusion in the broader community. And we are all ambassadors of sharing information with the broader community on uh, you know, what the uh, updated process is. And to my knowledge, uh, everything that public health has been aware of has been shared with members of council on a regular basis. And so uh, as, as these updates occur, uh, that information is shared, even though we do a you know, a one hour, uh, you know, update on Monday between three and four o'clock. Uh, pre that, uh, you get all the information that's shared during that uh, that media update and then throughout the rest of the week as things evolve. So I, I, I really encourage you to uh, to share with your constituents the information you get from our, our city staff that uh, provides them that information. Plus, we have an ongoing website. Uh, coronavirus website that can be accessed by anyone uh, that has all of the information that's currently being updated on there as well. And we have the hotline that people can call, 
to get additional information on anything that they have concern about. So there's a, there's a number of ways that people can get access to the, that information. So I encourage you all to share uh, whatever information you have with your constituents uh, that they can understand and appreciate that, uh, that, that these updates are happening. Uh, they need to be patient. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear on why one would wait to get the vaccine. Uh, to do it in a more, uh, you know, localized location unless they're unable to to move. And I certainly understand and appreciate that. And that's certainly an area that uh, that is also being considered in terms of how that vaccine gets delivered to those folks that are unable to leave their homes or unable to have the kind of mobility that would allow them to access our, our facilities. So I'm uh, I'm very uh, very pleased with uh, the work that our city staff is doing. There, uh, uh, I can I can tell you that minute to minute, day by day. Uh, the level of change that they have to deal with and, and, and adapt to uh, is, is equally as frustrating for them as it is for uh, for anyone else out there that's watching. And uh, I rest assured that everyone that's eligible and wants the vaccine is going to get one. One way or the other, they're going to get the vaccine. They're going to get vaccinated. Uh, they're not going to be missed. Uh, no one's going to overlook any particular any person in our community that would like to get vaccinated. And, encourage, and I would encourage everyone in our community to take up the vaccine because that is the surest and quickest way for us to get to a new level of normalcy in our community. So full encouragement for people to take it on. And we are actually bringing in ambassadors that uh, will help in some of the marginalized communities that seem to have some issues in terms of vaccine and update and some some uh, misunderstanding of uh, you know the, uh, the the research that's been done the uh, testing that's been done on all the vaccines and you know a, a fair bit of uh, you know global information that that gets transported from global sources into a local setting that uh, certainly helps confuse the matter even more. And so getting accurate information, I would I would uh, encourage people to go to trusted sources. And the most trusted sources is the city website, the provincial website, and all the information that you share with your constituents is the best way to keep them up to date and informed. So thank you, doctor, for all that great work and Michelle and all the great team there. And can I have a motion to receive this presentation, please? Moved by Councillor Nan, seconded by Councillor Jackson. All in favor, we'll have electronic vote. And thank you all for your questions. And uh, it's it's going to be a journey, and the journey is far from over. In terms of the next report, Doctor, and I'm equally mindful of time. Public Health Services year-end report and the uh, budget. I'll just wait for Lauren to tell me that the uh, previous is approved, which I assume it is. Thanks for your patience, Mr. Mayor. That does carry 12 to zero. Thank you. Richardson, back to you on item 9-2, the 2020 Public Health Services year-end report and the 2020 annual service plan budget. Mr. Mayor, if, I, if uh, I can, I would like to go through and just highlight a few things from the presentation that is there. Well, uh, some of it is the things that you've done before, but it's also a very good reminder that there are many other things that there are staff doing other than COVID-19 um, that are very important for our, uh, our community. I almost got it, Mr. Mayor, let me get this shared properly. Multitasking, I think it's finally starting to wear off in terms of my ability to do that. Here we go. Um, and so I'll take you through, I'm going to do an abbreviated uh, version of this. And I, I hate to do that because my colleagues are working very, very hard and it's exemplary work that is going on. But it is, uh, of course, we are, are pressured in terms of time for this, uh, this morning. Um, sorry, I'm just having some technical challenges back on my computer. Get this up and running properly here and then you'll be able to see. So, 
I just uh, want to take you through, you know, the kind of extraordinary year it was. And of course, we've probably done more social media this year than we've ever done. And this is just a conglomeration of many things that we've done that are COVID related. But you'll see things about beaches that are here. As I said, there's many other things that we do. You'll see things about substance abuse and National Addictions Awareness Week and all of those sorts of things. And so it uh, it has been really good work done by a host of people who are continuing to keep together some of our most essential programming as you go and so as we look at 2020 and where we were at, um, this is our org chart. It's kind of a functional organization chart. It shows you um, how many programs are focused on the COVID-19 response, which are highlighted in blue. And they are across our three traditional divisions that we've had, epidemiology, wellness, and communicable disease control, of course, having the most related to COVID-19. Healthy Environments um, can, it does some, and Kevin, of course, supports our uh, communications work overall, and Healthy Families as well, with Jen taking uh, up COVID planning and COVID logistics is, uh, throughout 2020. The pink programs are essential services that continue to be fully or partially operational throughout the year. And then the ones that are just gray are uh, the ones that were fully put on hold. We've already talked about the waves and I won't go through and talk about these further. You'll see throughout here um, the, the work that was done around case management and contact tracing throughout wave one and into wave two. Um, with case contact management itself, but also looking to get services to people on home care, do in-home testing with our paramedic services colleagues, working with uh, Shelter Health. You saw Tim O'Shea from Shelter Health um, here earlier this morning to look at testing and IPAC measures to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in vulnerable populations. And also, of course, working with employees and employers around what they could do. IPAC was a, a huge part of what we did, infection prevention and control, uh, whether that was in long-term care homes, retirement homes, in the agricultural sector in terms of tra uh, temporary farm workers, other congregate settings, um, it's like uh, the ones that Michelle was talking about, as well as supporting the business sector with understanding the Reopening Ontario Act. Outbreaks, of course, as you saw from Steph, a significant amount of what we did in trying to understand how to bring outbreaks quickly under control, what it was that uh, um, settings needed to do, like long-term care and retirement homes. And you'll have heard me talk about needing near-perfect adherence to infection prevention and control in order to gain control over outbreaks and to ensure that that's there all the time, which, of course, has a tremendous amount of wear on our colleagues who work in those settings to be wearing masks, to be wearing shields, to be doing all that they're doing very, very carefully to ensure that they reduce transmission in those settings. Lots of education that's gone on, testing. Of course, we've seen testing happen on a regular basis in, uh, in many different environments, including long-term care and retirement homes, but also in others. And then tremendous amounts of resources from our partners across the city to support some of the congregate settings that got into the most significant troubles when it came to outbreaks as we went forward. And of course, enforcement has been there throughout as well. And um, we reserve that for situations where education um, hasn't worked uh, and those supports, but occasionally that has been required too. We've already talked about the wave two um, uh, sort of timelines and moved on into recruiting, of course, those additional FTEs that we've talked about in the past. We've had 40 workers from the province join us who support us in case and contact management in wave two. We set up a new um, uh, case and contact management system uh, along with those across the province uh, in order to, uh, to better do case and contact management as they realized that our systems that we had really weren't quite up to the snuff in, uh, in Ontario. Um, COVID in schools, of course, has been a tremendous amount of what we have done as the schools reopened um, earlier this year with additional full-time employees open, uh, hired to um, assist in the schools, 23 new employees along with our existing school program, and they have been supporting those schools now for some time to, uh, to operate safely. Um, 
Again, the business sector continued to be a significant piece for us in that uh, they, while there's a fair amount of guidance from the province, it still didn't sort of filter through and get understood at the local business level. They don't have, many of those businesses don't have a background in, that included infection, infection prevention and control, they didn't have dedicated people to do that work um, with them. And so we have worked with the chamber to try and get as much expertise and resources to people so they can operate safely. Um, just want to highlight though some of the things that were happening in our usual programs and services. And so one of the things that happens in these situations is you get opportunities to accelerate putting in things that you wanted to do. So virtual care was something we were already exploring. And so with the imperative to go to virtual care and the openness then of people to use virtual care, we've been able to, um, to use that in many of our programs and services. So we had 204 virtual visits, for example, uh, around breastfeeding, lower than our overall in-person visits, but it certainly gave us a venue and a means to reach uh, people while the, we were going through COVID-19. Um, online prenatal education, 1,300 uh, registrants, which is more than three times the number who registered in 2019. So very good news that people were reaching out and getting the information they needed to have a healthy pregnancy through um, that venue. 144 virtual walk-in referrals for mental health services for our children and youth and their families, which was twice the number that took advantage of that in 2019. And we moved from in-person directly observed therapy for TB, TB being a long, it requires long treatment of six, nine, 12, maybe even longer months. And of course, not many of us can say that we do um, our, our, our use of our medications diligently, perfectly every day without some help. And so the infectious disease program helps people to do that for TB with these long regimens. And 71% of our cases we were able to look after in that way. A lot of outreach that went on, so uh, we were able to, to still see over a thousand clients at the dental bus um, and in the dental uh, clinic, another t almost 2,400 using, of course, very careful infection prevention and control to ensure our staff were kept safe and our clients were kept safe, but very important for our community where we're uh, providing services to vulnerable groups that otherwise wouldn't have care. Um, harm reduction, of course, you've heard about mental health and substance abuse, and so we were able to increase um, the amount of service that we provided in uh, those areas over COVID-19 in terms of uh, naloxone kits, needle exchange, those sorts of things. Uh, despite what was uh, happening and the extent of redeployment of our staff, we were able to get the grade seven eight immunization catch-up clinics off the ground as schools reopened. These are the clinics that give meningococcal um, vaccine, that give HPV vaccine, that give hepatitis B vaccine and are critical to have done by that age in uh, a person's life. And so, you know, I was very worried if we hadn't been able to go through with uh, those vaccination clinics, what that might mean, particularly for this age group as they move on uh, to the next stages in their lives. And so very glad that we were able to get those off the ground. Um, we also uh, were working on climate change. Trevor and his crew, as you know very well, very much looking at sustainable um, neighborhood action plans and climate change and those sorts of initiatives. Community engagement, of course, has been a key part of what we've done. Uh, we've done a lot of collaboration with our Indigenous communities to look at their needs and barriers that are related to COVID um, through our health strategy specialist who uh, works with various organizations and members in our community. There's been, you've seen a ton of intelligence and graphs and charts uh, that we've never seen used to this extent before, but of course been supporting, uh, particularly around COVID-19, a lot of information for decision makers in our community. Um, our staff, our public health inspectors are trained as our, our MLE to help enforce the physical distancing and face covering bylaws. And so that extended our ability to do that here in Hamilton. And we implemented with Good Shepherd a new a low barrier access to mental health supports for children and youth, which has been very important, particularly at this time during the pandemic. Other successes that uh, we managed to carry on while we were having as many people deployed to COVID as we did, uh, you'll know our radon prevalence study, which we've talked about in terms of keeping people safe from the effects of radon. 
Um, there are many other uh, infectious diseases that we continue to manage and do case and contact management on, outbreak control on. And so almost 3,600 cases, other cases of reportable diseases over and above those related to COVID, and as well, another 69 outbreaks that, uh, that were managed that were from due to other viruses. Uh, we maintained our prenatal screening and our home visits on that front, which was very good, particularly given uh, limited access due to COVID-19. So the percentage of high-risk clients who accepted a home visit was similar to the previous year. Um, that was at 82% in 2020 and 84% in 2019. And, um, you know, connecting with families was very much more difficult because of the COVID restrictions and the shift to telephone or virtual visiting, but uh, it was tremendous that we still managed to do that many. And we uh, had 12% of the birth cohort received a prenatal screen. That's something that's very important to have done as well, particularly for those at risk. And that was up a little bit from 11% in 2019. And then again, on the climate uh, front, a lot of work done there with the Bay Area Climate Change Council with over 100 uh, community members attending its, uh, its meeting and uh, the first two youth climate international collab catalyst projects were done and then the work to invite experts from Humber College to um, training sessions on deep energy, retrofits and, uh, and those sorts of pieces as well. So for 2021, um, our principals, when we asked our managers, because we still do do program planning and all of those pieces, budgeting, budget uh, variance reports, all have to be done while we're doing this, uh, this response. Um, so some principles were to continue with COVID-19 response and other essential services to ensure we continue to incorporate an equitable response and recovery into our planning and to look at uh, uh, towards the end of the year, a focus on recovery post COVID-19 as vaccine rates go up. So you'll see our four priorities, our four sort of guiding stars, if you will, around balancing the COVID-19 response with the essential services we continue to, to provide. Health equity, of course, has been a principle and a goal um, guiding us for the uh, many years. Mental health and addictions as well. And of course, we added climate change um, last year. You'll see this org chart for 2021, our functional organization chart looks a little bit bigger than the one you saw earlier, and that's because of that vaccine program. So this vaccine program is a huge program that we have underway here with these different um, uh, aspects of it, everything from clinic planning to running the mobile and pop-up clinics to running the large scale clinics. You can imagine that that scale that we're talking about, that's a huge endeavor. Um, the vaccine booking and hotline with Al's group, as we've talked about, just managing the supplies, the needles, the IPAC supplies, the masks, the, everything that's needed uh, to run those clinics. And we do process the supplies for everybody who's running a clinic, um, including primary care and others. So um, that is, uh, is coming through with all the vaccine that we handle. COVAX itself, that, I mean, that provincial system is a bit of a challenge and it's take, taken a lot of uh, work by our tech folks, but our staff as well to work with it and to also then be get able to get some information out of it so we can do some reporting on it as well. Of course, um, the vaccine itself has to be managed and it has some very specific requirements because you know we're dealing with some challenging vaccines from a temperature control perspective. And then, of course, there are things that happen uh, following immunization, some adverse events that follow, fortunately, very few. Um, but our job is to uh, collect information on those, investigate them, give some advice, and ha pass them along to both the province and the federal government, who, of course, collect all of this information to continue to assess our, uh, the safety of vaccines. So, again, you'll see our pink programs are the ones that remain open in part or in full, uh, while other programs have been closed virtually um, entirely in order to do the response. So I'll leave you with these to look at at your leisure, but these are the ones that are in those categories of essential, high, medium, or low risk, uh, so you know what's happening. Um, that front, um, but I did just want to end with a budget slide and there's a few other budget slides that are here for your information based on questions we often get. Our usual public health um, program budget or public health division budget is about $50 million, $51 million. And you'll see here 
that um, there are huge amounts that have been dedicated to now COVID-19 vaccine, which the province will fund in the to the tune of $34.5 million. Our overall COVID response, about $14.5 million. So making up between the two, over half of our, or almost half of our total budget. Um, the rest of the usual annual service plan and budget is here at $44,000. Some of those resources, of course, are also getting ded dedicated to the COVID response. They're being redeployed to that. And then there are, of course, our other programs, Healthy Babies, Healthy Children, and the prenatal Canadian Prenatal Nutrition Program that are 100% funded by the province or the federal government. Um, alcohol, drug, and gambling services, which are, again, 100% funded by the provincial government, and then some other levy programs, such as the RCF program, the additional seniors' dollars that are here, and a few other dollars that are here. So just wanted to make sure you're aware of where this is sitting at this point, and some 677 FTEs, as outlined in the report, that make up uh, the staff supporting this bigger response. So I'll end it there, uh, Mr. Mayor. I did want to just draw your attention to those highlights and uh, you have the, the report as well, with, which has some additional details and uh, happy to answer any questions. Mr. Mayor, you are muted. I've done it again. Sorry, I was waiting for you to unmute uh, and I was the muted one. Uh, sorry, I, I see no uh, questions at this point. I do know that uh, you were searching for quorum. Quorum has been achieved, Lauren. I think I see it. Yes, it has. Okay, yes, uh, the recommendation is the report is to receive it and to approve the uh, work plan and the budget. So a motion to do that moved by Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Pearson. Any comments or questions? If not, we'll go right to a vote. Okay, electronic vote on that, please. And thank you, doctor, for the uh, overview and the whole range of other impact beyond COVID that uh, needs to continue. So uh, a, a double challenge in terms of uh, all those very, very important issues on top of what we uh, primarily are focused on it as well as COVID. So thank you for that great work. Mr. Mayor, that carries 11-0 and we will need a vote to receive the presentation. Thank you. Uh, so moved by Pearson, seconded by Wilson to receive that presentation, electronic vote as well. I saw some applause coming from the, uh, the gallery, doctor, just so you know, hopefully you saw it too. And uh, Distinguished Woman of the Year, we can't say that often enough. That'll be for the entire year. Uh, as often as I can, I will mention that. Uh, very deserving, congratulations again. I think you got a standing or a sitting ovation. Mr. Mayor, that carries 11-0. Great, thank you. I know Public Works is just around the corner, so thank you all very much for a very, very, uh, Lively meeting, much appreciated, and I'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved by Jackson, seconded by Ferguson, and everyone else. It will be an electronic vote as well. And there we are. And there you go. And thank you very much. Have a great afternoon and a great public works meeting. Sayonara.